Essex County Board of Chosen Freeholders is hereby called to order. Madam Clerk, can you please call roll? Freeholder Bovadia, absent. Freeholder Vice President Gill. Here. Freeholder Johnson. Here. Freeholder Jones. Present. Freeholder Luciano, absent. Freeholder Richardson. Here. Freeholder Siebel. Here. Freeholder Toro. Present. Freeholder Bovadia. Present. Freeholder President Timberlake. Here. Thank you. Please stand to salute the flag. I'm going to ask the Freeholder Bovadia, please lead us in the salute. Please remain standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. I have before me a certification from the clerk that this meeting is indeed in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. Madam Clerk, are there any transcripts to be approved? Um, Madam President, yes, there are two. Conference Board meeting June 8th, 2016 and June 22nd, 2016. Okay. Thank you. Do you yep. have a mover and a second to approve these transcripts? <coughs> Freelder Toro, Freelder Johnson, roll call, Madam Clerk. Freelder Bobadilla, yes. Freelder Vice President Gill, yes. Freelder Johnson, yes. Freelder Jones, yes. Freelder Luciano, absent. Freelder Richardson, yes. Freelder Seabol, yes. Freelder Toro, yes. Freelder President Timberlake, yes. So moved. Thank you. Are there any topics of discussion? Uh, Madam President, yes. A presentation of the 2016 mid-year report by Director Deborah Collins, Esquire, the Office of Small Business Development and Affirmative Action. Thank you. Mr. Chalala? Uh, yes, the administration is uh, pleased to uh, have Ms. Collins present her uh, mid-year report to the board. And at this time, I'll call Ms. Collins up uh, to give her report. Deborah. Good evening, Madam President, members of the Board of Chosen Freeholders. For the record, I'm Deborah Collins, appearing this evening in my capacity as Director of Small Business Development and Affirmative Action for the County of Essex. Yeah, before I begin my report, I'd like to place the comments that I make in, uh, in context for you. Uh, a couple of days ago, I decided to just check the census once again to look at some figures that I think will be important <coughs> to you. According to the United Bless States you. Small Business Administration, small businesses provide 55% of all jobs and 66% of all net new jobs, and this has been the case since the 1970s. Since 1990, as big business has eliminated 4 million jobs, small businesses added 8 million new jobs. I share this with you in order to underscore the fact that the Small Business Development Initiative of the County of Essex is critical to the growth of the American economy, not to say the least, of course, it's also critical to the growth of the economy of this very fine county. It is our hope and endeavor that all that we do with respect to providing resources and support will allow new businesses to come into being thereby creating additional jobs. You should have before you a copy of our semi-annual report, and I'm going to go over it in high level and then ask whether or not you have any questions. What we endeavor to do, let me just say for the record that the mission of the Office of Small Business Development and Affirmative Action is to position small, woman-owned, minority, veteran-owned, and other businesses to compete successfully for county contracts. And we do that by ensuring that they have a full and fair opportunity to learn about contracts with the county. In addition, we spend a great deal of time on outreach. We do so in order to be able to compile a pool 
of potential contractors to bid on upcoming opportunities. That's important to us. So, for example, as you know, we host on average anywhere from 10 to 12 seminars, workshops, and training <coughs> programs per year for that specific purpose. If you have the report before you, you'll note at page two that we have broken it down with respect to reporting out the county spend in terms of quarters. In the first quarter of 2016, our records show that the county spent $106,520,280 overall in what we call private contracts. That means we exclude uh, such things as rents and utilities, et cetera. So this is just contracts that one has to compete in order to win, compete for in order to win. Our target population received 22% of the total or $23,917,454. And then we go on to break down that percentage for you by classification. We include one classification that we don't always talk about, and that's the what's called the disadvantaged business enterprise um, category. That's a federal designation that both New Jersey Transit and the New York, uh, New York and New Jersey Port Authority use for um, businesses that are for profit with socially and economic disadvantage, economically disadvantaged individuals own at least a 51% of the business. In the second quarter of 2016, the county awarded $32,595,368 in private contracts to our target population. And that constitutes roughly 74%. The percentage this second quarter was huge, and the numbers are a little bit skewed, which is why I give to you a footnote at number two, because, of course, as you know, we are in the process of building another park. It's a huge venture, an $11 million contract, and it was awarded to J.C. Landscaping and Management Park. It's the Cedar Grove Park, by the way. Now, we have also begun, and we've done this for several years now, but we're getting more into capturing the actual public works subcontracting goals, the aspirational goals that are on many of our federal contracts that come to us by way of DOT monies. And we have done so with respect to the Berkeley Avenue Bridge in the township of Bloomfield. This project has, is funded by the Department of Transportation. Therefore, there is an aspirational goal of 12% participation of what are called emerging small business enterprises, same thing as small business enterprises, and disadvantaged business enterprises. To date, we're at about 0.18%, but this is a project that will com not complete until March of 2017, so we'll continue to monitor our progress, and you, you'll see at Exhibit C that we give you a breakdown of the actual utilization of subcontractors on this project. As I said, is essential to our efforts is outreach. Outreach is critical, therefore we often partner with other organizations that share our belief that you have to level the playing field in order to, for small women and minority business owners to be successful. In January of 2016, we met with representatives of the New Jersey branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and the Chief Diversity Officer, Luis Diaz, uh, and Director of Intellectual Property for Gibbons PC. And the point of that was to start a dialogue around how we could collaborate with other entities that share our commitment to diversity as well as affirmative action. Out of that particular meeting, we were able to pull together the very first diversity and inclusion seminar, continuing legal education seminar for the New Jersey State um, Bar Association. Yeah, at, you know, over the past six months, we've held five seminars and one OSHA, OSHA stands for Occupational Safety and Health Administration, 30-hour outreach training program as it has come to our attention that, of course, in order for subcontractors and laborers to be able to participate on many of the county's construction projects, this is a required certification. We began the year, however, on January 22nd when we held a seminar on building capacity minority women and small businesses in construction. The point of it was, in fact, to give them vital information on insurance and bidding, estimating, licenses and certifications, et cetera. It was another way for us to assist in identifying potentially qualified vendors and contractors to work on the vocational technical school that the uh, County of Essex is building. Over the past few years, it's been our practice to identify and document 
the number of contracts that we've awarded to vendors over the years who have attended our workshops, primarily because we get the question, why do you host so many workshops? What's the point of it? Is it for entertainment purposes? Not at all. In fact, our position is if you do not extract some information that you didn't have prior to attending a workshop, there's no point in attending whatsoever. So we began to document the number of vendors who have actually won contracts as a consequence of learning how to do business with the county. So to date, 77 contractors, since our very first outreach event in 2006, have received a total of over $20,789,261 as a direct result of our outreach efforts. We talk about technology as well at page four, if you're following along, uh, because it is incumbent upon small businesses, irrespective of their classifications, to saturate the market by stimulating business growth. And one way to do that is by ensuring that you have a presence on the internet. There's a tool that many business owners are using today called LinkedIn, and we held a workshop specifically to take our vendors through the step-by-step -step process of utilizing LinkedIn to grow their, um, their list of businesses and their list of customers. The site is free, we talked about that, but the presenter, a specialist on the topic, addressed such, thing as pro such topics as promoting your brand to thousands of potential clients, leveraging LinkedIn to increase your visibility in the marketplace, and key strategies to succeed on LinkedIn within a 30-day period. It was a very, very popular workshop, so we're thinking of um, hosting it again next year. Facebook is another medium that we're using to broaden our reach. Uh, we recently had a seminar entitled Demystifying the RFP Process, and we used Facebook in order to reach out to potential attendees. 201 people visited our page, but we want to drum up more traffic. We want to stimulate more traffic not only to Facebook, but to our website, it's because we know that these days many more business owners are doing business online and looking, of course, to enhance or their presence in the online space. We urge business owners to register with us. We say the same thing to you. If you know of business owners who are qualified, ready, willing, and able to compete for county contracts, please send them our way so that we can help them to get certified and point them in the right direction for sourcing funding as well, much needed capital to sustain their, their current operations or to build capacity. In June of this year, in partnership with Corporate Council Women of Color, Corporate Council Women of Color, by the way, is an organization that has over 3,000 members across the globe, we created an instructional video on marketing principles for lawyers, lawyers too, solo practitioners, have a need to learn how to grow their businesses, and we're reaching out to them as well. The bottom line is each year we endeavor to offer new and different seminars based upon feedback that we receive from attendees at our workshops. One of the most popular workshops that we host is the request for proposal process where the Public Works Department uh, partners, is with, partners with us and in fact invites engineers to walk through the RFP process including evaluation and how we get from the publication of the RFP to the actual awarding of a contract. Well, and the bottom line is this year we're continuing to foster new and build upon existing relationships with organizations that share the county's commitment to equal access and opportunity. Toward this end, we've, we have uh, built upon our existing partnership with the Newark Community Economic Development Corporation that's bringing together over 30 representatives from the County of Essex to talk about how we can pool our resources and create additional opportunities through coordinated efforts. And we're beginning to see some results. In summary, our ongoing relationships with uh, the Newark Community Economic Development Corporation, the Greater Newark Economic, Development, uh, Economic Corporations, and others place us in a position to be a conduit for funding opportunities in support of our small business owners. And as we continue to explore these relationships and create new partnerships, we're grateful, I want to say to this board, we're grateful for your visibility at our seminars. I want to thank uh, 
to uh, Patricia Siebold, to Freeholder Siebold for her constant support. She's always at our seminars, as are many of our freeholders, and we're grateful for that support. It means a lot to the vendors who are there, and we want you to continue to support us as we continue putting Essex County first. This concludes the report. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to take them at this time. Mr. McInerney? The county is following a trend that was started by the state of New Jersey. They have created, in fact, this designation veteran-owned business, and they're beginning now to track dollars that are spent with veterans. So we're doing so. We very seldom get any. But we're going to see, the trend is that they're starting to come in more and more to learn about opportunities to do business with the county, so we're going to start tracking those dollars. There is. Like there is. For, for there absolutely is. Okay. It's a brand new certification. Right. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Freeholders, Freeholder Richardson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a couple questions. So on page two, you talked about 2016, first quarter, the county spent $106 million plus. And 22% of that, equaling 23 million plus, went to it was 22% went to minority and small businesses. So exactly how many businesses are we talking about? That that breaks breaks down. If you take a look at Appendix A, we list every single contract that was awarded and the names of the businesses who received them. Okay. How many African American uh, companies or small businesses one We use the same designation that the Small Business Administration uses, and that's Minority Business Enterprise, which captures African Americans, Latinos, Asians, etc. So we don't break out the number of African Americans. In order to do that, of course, we would have to go to one of our partners like um, the DOT or the New Jersey and New York Port Authority. They break out that information. So all of these businesses that we're talking about, these uh, the 22 percent of those, all uh, Essex County uh, businesses, or are they from anywhere? They're from anywhere because we we, we be talking about uh, minority businesses from Pennsylvania. Whoever bids on our contracts and wins one, wherever that business is located, if they're designated as a minority business enterprise, we capture that information. Right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have another question. Uh, I guess it's page four. We talked about over uh, the past few years, I guess 10 years actually, mm -hmm. from 06 to 2016. Right. Uh, and 77 awardees uh, won contracts of 20 million. And just in 2016, they won a whole lot more just for, for that quarter. So, why the big difference here over a 10 year span? Mm -hmm. Is, is less than what was one issue. All right, through you, Madam President. Let me explain that this is a small slice of a greater or larger full picture. This 77 awardee figure speaks directly to individuals who actually attended our seminars or workshops and won a contract. It's not the entire total of business owners who have won contracts over the years. It's that small group well, not so small, actually, of individuals who came to a workshop, learned how to do business with the county, and won a contract. Prior to uh, your administration, Madam President, one of our former freeholders said, well, I don't understand why you have all of these workshops. What are people getting out of them? Tell us how many people who have actually attended your workshops have received contracts. And we had never sliced the data that way. So we thought, now that's a very interesting question. Let's go back, look at the numbers, and track people who have attended and have actually received contracts, and that's what this 77 uh, number or figure refers to. Thank you. You're welcome. Free Elders, Free Elders Seabolt. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend uh, Deborah Collins on all the work that she does. I've been to many of the seminars and workshops, and I'm always amazed that all the people who are there are so interested in what is being discussed. And oftentimes there are people there who have received contracts in the past and they are speaking to the people who are there and telling them what they have to do to succeed in the future.
to get a contract. And as I said, it always amazes me, everyone who is there is so interested in what is happening. And it is really a pleasure to attend and see so many people who are really concerned. So thank you, Deborah, for all the work that you do. Uh, thank you, Madam Freeholder. I'd just uh, like to thank Ms. Collins uh, because we requested a presentation to the nonprofit consortium we mm -hmm. had a few months back and you know you provided the RFP process information uh, to the nonprofits that attended. Um, I'm also very interested in attending the next LinkedIn workshop that you have. Um, I'm interested in learning more about it myself. Uh, and I am a strong supporter of your OSHA 30 hour outreach workshop because I know working with the unemployed and a lot of people in, in um, construction that having that on the resume really makes them more marketable. And you know, being that it's a free service, I, I just know that it's a great uh, tool for them to have under the belt when they're seeking for work. So if we could always expand them, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Freeholder. If I may, uh, we are actually presenting a workshop on digital marketing on September 29th. If you haven't already received flyers, we'll make sure that you get them. It will be a panel discussion by experts who talk about how you specifically can broaden your outreach and grow your client base by using the Internet. It's hugely uh, popular, so we would like you to, of course, extend the invitation to your constituents as well. Jones. Uh, Ms. Collin, I want to commend you on the report that is given to us. But I want to just ask a hypothetical question, thinking in terms of the area that I live in, in Essex County. What about these entrepreneurs who are minorities with want to open a business and serve the community and take care of their family, but number one, they don't have the finance. <clears throat> Number two, with that check that you have to go through in terms of the bank, in terms of collateral that you have to put up to start a, a, a business. And number three is when you do that police search, whether they were arrested, they could have been arrested but never convicted. How do we reach that part of the population? Because those are the people who are doing the work, they cannot afford to come to workshops and take care of their families. And there is no, what would you suggest, or could you give me a list of things that I can go back to the community mm -hmm. and tell those people who are business people, working honest people, how to get into the mainstream of getting contracts through the county or your municipalities. Thank you, Madam Freeholder. Through you, Madam President. Let me put it this way. Some years ago, we ran a bonding program, and one of the attendees was a gentleman who had been to prison, and he said to me, Ms. Collins, how will I ever be able to qualify for bonding? And we actually approached the uh, Surety and Fidelity Association of America with this very issue, because our belief, of course, is that if you've paid your debt to society, this should not be, there should not be yet another hurdle to your becoming a contributing member of society. So I take your points entirely. But for the individuals who cannot come to our workshops, it's crucial that they have access to a computer and that they go on to our website, ecbizcenter.com, where we list all of the resources that we offer, credit management, how to again get your credit score up, uh, online tutorials that you can take. We're actually working on that right now. We engaged a consultant to analyze our workshop, uh, I'm sorry, analyze our website in order to make it more easily accessible to people who cannot, to your point, come in in the morning or take the time out to come to us. On the other hand, I also want to mention, and I want to thank uh, Freeholder Johnson for this, we will come to the community. Freeholder Johnson and I have gone up and down Springfield Avenue visiting business owners to say, here's what's available. We can help you. We can refer you to other sources if we don't have what you need. So please, and Phil the Bobadilla, I thank you as well. He's done the same. 
invited us to speak, we will go to the community if the community cannot come to us. Realtor those businesses, Realtor Jones. I just want to say, those businesses that is on Springfield Avenue, those are merchants who do not live in the community. Those are merchants that serve the community. But I'm talking about John Blow, Paul, Peter, whoever, Omega, whatever, that you see painting, landscaping, um, doing all sorts of work in the community because many of the residents in lower income cannot afford to get are businesses legitimately who are bonded to do the work. Those are the people that I'm talking about in terms of you could just put it on your website or give me what they need to do because most of them don't have good credit. Mm -hmm. So how can they get into the field of trying to become independent and become business owners within the community, maybe they can grow and, 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 and make bids, but what can, they, what can you tell me mm -hmm. that I'm able to tell this man or this woman mm -hmm. who puts in 40, 50 hours a week, mm -hmm. but at the same time don't have the credential nor the money, mm -hmm. and they're excellent, they're experts, mm -hmm. but they just don't have the finance for the bonding mm -hmm. to get in the door, and their foot in the door of trying to change to become legitimate and that they're mm -hmm. in a position. That, that, that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Madam President, we would be happy to include suggestions or tips on our website for the population that you've described. Okay. Madam Freeholder, I will also mention that a couple of years ago, we presented a home improvement contractors workshop that was very well attended because there's a certification that even they must have and many don't know that. So I thank you for both suggestions. We will certainly take them under advisement and ensure that there's information on our website to address your concerns. Freeholder Bobadilla. Yeah, to, um, to piggyback on what Freeholder Jones was saying, you know, I think some of our websites are underutilized, uh, especially the official uh, Essex County website and to some extent our Freeholder uh, website. And, and maybe possibly the administration and you, Madam President, would consider on uploading these workshops into those two websites so mm -hmm. we create a, a more points of access. Mm -hmm. That is actually, uh, to you, through you, Madam President, that's a great suggestion, Freeholder Bobadilla. We have actually considered it before. It would involve, of course, our engaging a consultant to videotape the workshops. And then we've tried that in the past. It hasn't worked as well as we would have liked, but we're willing to try that again. I, I, I personally favor online tutorials for people who cannot, for whatever the reason, get out to attend the workshops. But I think it's a great suggestion, yeah. and we will look into it for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a, I tell you, every time I want to solve a problem or I have an issue, whether it's a, a car or dishwasher, whatever, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly on YouTube, and I think it's a great learning tool. So maybe if we can incorporate some of that educational aspects into our websites, I think that would be a great tool for people to have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Piggyback what you're talking about, yeah. I, I believe the, um, the U.S. Department of Trademark, they, have, they did this entire uh, overhaul of their media and their outreach where there's a lot of YouTube videos that give suggestions about how to go through their trademark website, what to do to register with the federal government, so on and so forth. So your comment made me think of that. So that might be an example that of another uh, department in a governing mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam, Madam body President. is using. We will actually look into that. As I said, it's an excellent idea, not one that we've utilized as often as we should, but I think it's an excellent idea, and we will pursue it. Freeholders, so uh, my comments are generally the same regarding those reports. I have attended the, the classes that you, you put forth and I think they're wonderful and I think you're doing a great job with them. Thank you. Um, they are very informative uh, classes and I hope that anyone who is listening um, or anyone who's even in the audience, if you would like to tell someone about it, they should attend. Uh, demystifying the RFP process was very good. But, uh, you know, numbers, they can be very interesting. Um, they can be so interesting, especially when put into context, you know, 
$2,384,000 is a lot when put in the context of an individual. I think if any individual within the sound of my voice hears that they have $2 million plus dollars, they're going to be very excited and happy. But when put in the context of Essex County, when we have over a $700 million budget, it's not, um, it's not as overwhelming as far as meaning, to me at least. So 22% of the total of the total uh, for this quarter was given, uh, contracts were awarded to small businesses, minority businesses, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and then disadvantaged business enterprise. That's correct, right? Yes. And then to see, okay, 18% of it is small business, but small businesses, they don't necessarily mean mom and pop, they don't necessarily mean that that small business that has five people working there. A small business can have 100 uh, employees, 100 or, or less employees. Um, whereas if you are a mom and pop shop and you hear that a business has 99 employees, you don't automatically think of them as a small business. Um, so that's at 18%, which is the one that is taking up most of the 22%. But then the minority-owned business is at 2%, women-owned business at 1%, and then the veteran-owned business at 0.2%, and then the disadvantaged business enterprise at 1%. So I, I would like to, along with uh, some of my colleagues that share the same sentiment, like to see the numbers go up, and I know and have confidence in your department that you're doing, um, you're putting measures in place to do just that, but perhaps taking some of the suggestions that were given tonight, uh, the next numbers will be higher. Mm -hmm. With all due respect, Madam President, uh, the statistics also show that over 96% of small businesses are solopreneurs. They're one shop or two shop operations. And as a consequence, they are unable to bid on an $11 million contract. So you're going to see smaller percentages. I think what we are working very diligently to do is ensure that some of the low-hanging fruit, meaning those opportunities for which smaller businesses can, in fact, uh, qualify and they can perform well, that those opportunities become available to our business owners as well. But that's the whole point around having a small business development initiative. It is to enable businesses to reach capacity exceed capacity, partner with other business owners in order to bid on larger contracts. So we appreciate your support, your observation. We take your point entirely, and that is why we continue to work as, as hard as we do to try to get business owners to grow. Yes, thank you. And you are correct in uh, what you stated regarding small businesses, but small businesses is making up 18% of the 22%. It's really the minority business, the women business, uh, the veteran business and the disadvantaged business that's making up the 2%, the 1%, the 0.2% and the 1% that um, is most alarming. So thank you so much for everything it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Freeholders? Thank you. Mr. McInerney, Ms. Salam? Thank you so much, Ms. Collins, for My pleasure. providing thank you. us with your report. Okay, Madam Clerk, let's move to public comment session on agenda items only. And for anyone that is watching or who is here tonight, tonight's meeting is a conference board meeting in which we will vote on as well as discuss every issue um, or every item on the agenda. So if there's any member of the public wishing to comment on any item on the agenda, please come forward, state your name and affiliation for the record, You'll have three minutes to speak, monitored by the clock to my right. Good evening, uh, Madam Chairman, and, and uh, to all of you at the board. Uh, my name is Beverly Brown Ruja, and I am the Community Reinvestment Advocate for Organizer for New Jersey Citizen Action, a statewide nonprofit organization that has been fighting for social and economic justice for more than 30 years in this state. I'm here on behalf of our 100 affiliate organizations and more than 50,000 individual members to thank Freeholder Board uh, and Board uh, President um, Brittany Timberlake for proposing the resolution to urge the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to issue 
the strongest payday and car title loan rule possible. We urge the board uh, to pass the resolution. The unfair, deceptive, and predatory nature of payday lending is self-evident. There's no rationale or moral argument that can be made to justify loans with interest rates and fees that average 400 percent. It's blatantly disingenuous to suggest that payday loans are helpful to people who do not have the ability to pay them back and who end up in an endless cycle of debt after taking out these loans. It's deceptive to promote a service with a structure designed to undo the outcome it is marketed to provide. New Jersey has a 30% usury cap, which prohibits high interest rate payday loans. Despite our state prohibition, predatory payday and car title lenders still market to and issue loans to desperate New Jersey borrowers via the internet and through lead, local lead generators with impunity. On June 2nd, 2016, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued a proposed national rule meant to rein in abusive payday and car title lending. The rule is a good start, but it includes loopholes that could undermine the New Jersey usury cap and other consumer protection laws in place in our state. The rule also fails to provide explicit reinforcement of um, state debt, debt trap prohibitions and bans in states uh, like New Jersey and the CFPB, which is not able to issue a national cap, could still declare any violation of state law, such as the making, of, making or marketing of illegal loans uh, to our citizens, as unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices. Your resolution sent, would, will send a strong message to the CFPB and to the industry that Essex County will do all that it can to keep predatory lenders out of our county and our state and to stop the debt trap once and for all. Thank you, and I hope you'll pass the resolution. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Lorena Guadiana. Um, I am a uh, housing and community um, development scholar uh, in, of New Jersey in Trenton. Um, I am also a recent graduate of Rutgers University. I just graduated with a master's in planning and policy, um, dual degree. Um, I wanted to come forward because, I, um, aside from um, you know urging you to support this uh, resolution to protect consumers against payday lending, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the couple of identities that I carry. Again, I am a recent student, um, graduate student, uh, just finished my degrees, but I'm really concerned for um, you know consumers. I, I grew up in, in a working class community uh, myself. Um, I am a product of a single parent household and also a uh, immigrant of Mexico. So these are some of the communities that are very vulnerable to these, um, you know, to this uh, type of loans. So it's really important that we protect consumers. You know, as someone that has studied policy recently, um, you know, I, I really urge you that you use the position that you have right now to really protect the consumers. Um, you know, these uh, loans are, as previously mentioned, um, they're up to a 300% plus in interest rates, and we shouldn't be putting out um, products out there for the communities that are already cash-strapped. Um, the Center for uh, Responsible Lending has recently produced research that New Jersey is saving more than $190 million um, because we don't have payday lending in the state. So I would certainly urge you to protect these communities. Um, I myself come from some of these very um, difficult, you know, uh, challenging uh, places where people have to, you know, decide, you know, do I have to feed my family today and how do I do it? But we also shouldn't be preying on these communities and we should be working together to produce products that are going to help our communities and not um, you know, put them in a more difficult situation. Thank you very much and I hope you pass this resolution. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Colleen Martinez and I'm a Montclair resident. Just briefly, I wanted to share with Ms. Collins, who I believe already left, but anyone else that might be interested in using social media to engage the community, Facebook Live is a new free tool that may be a resource to help broadcast live content and even engage viewers who aren't present at the workshop. 
Um, the live broadcast sessions can also be recorded and shared on other platforms like YouTube, so that might be a good resource for you to share with her. Um, but I'm really here to speak with you on behalf of the group Montclair residents opposed to the Fulbright Charter School. We now number over 1,000 individuals and are joined by many groups in Montclair, including the Montclair NAACP and Montclair Town Council, who are united in opposing this proposed French Immersion Charter School in Montclair. I'm here tonight to ask you to please approve the proposal to send a resolution from the Essex Board of Chosen Freeholders to the State Commissioner of Education, David Hespy, opposing the French Immersion Charter application. If the charter is it approved, if the charter is approved, it will not only devastate the Montclair Public Schools, but it also has the potential to harm all of the Essex County Public Schools. For those in the audience who are not aware, if a charter school does not fill its seats with district residents, then it can enroll students from other districts. Every district in Essex County might lose money from this from their school budget if this charter school is approved. So again, I appreciate your time and service. I thank you Freeholders Gill and Timberlake for your responsiveness thus far. And I ask all of you to please approve the re and send the resolution to Commissioner Hespy opposing the French Immersion Charter School application in Montclair. Thank you. Thank you. And prior to the meeting um, begin, Freeholder Cynthia Toro is also joining us in this as well. Uh, she asked me prior to the meeting and freeholder Wayne Richardson just raised his hand to join as well as did freeholder Johnson Want to do a by acclamation? By acclamation? Yes. Freeholders? Yes. I'd like to pass, uh, we would like to to add it by acclamation. Are there any other members of the public wishing to comment on agenda items only? Okay, are there any members of the public wishing to speak on any issue at all? If so, please come forward, state your name and affiliation for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak, monitored by the clock to my right. Good evening. Dana Roan, Essex County Register of Deeds and Mortgages. Um, first, let me thank the Freeholder Board for supporting me on uh, the functions of my office. Um, I wrote some notes today because um, I wanted to um, not be emotional today, this evening. So I wrote, I have done everything I needed to do to gain legal clarity as to the perimeters of the office, of my position, and about what authority I do and do not have regarding matters of the register's office. This is not a personal or political issue. It is written in the New Jersey State Constitution that as the Essex County Register, I have full and autonomous decision-making authority as to the personnel, budget, salary, operations, and functions of my office by carrying out my responsibilities as the Essex County Register as I was elected to do so by the voters of this county. Since coming into office, I began experiencing delays. Initially, I was confused. But since time has gone by, it has become clear that there is either confusion within the county administration or disagreement as to who holds decision-making authority and what the relationship is between us. I have worked hard to do my due diligence to discover what the state dictates as to what this relationship is. I have identified case law from the Superior Court of New Jersey in addition to the New Jersey Commission of Investigations report conducted on all county clerks and registers throughout the state. Both explicitly state the role of the Essex County Register's Office and how the county supports my office. So that we may all be clear about what the law states, I would like to share with you what it says. I have a transcript proceedings by Judge Reginald Stanton in the Superior Court of New Jersey Law Division, docket number SSXL. 37895. It is a decision between Helen Ackerman, who was then the county clerk of Sussex County as the plaintiff, versus the Board of Chosen Freeholders of Sussex County as the defendant. This is the decision of Reginald Stanton in 1995. Ms. Rome, yes. can I pause for one second, as is our practice when we have those who um, are elected or who are from uh, the actual governing body of Essex that we 
do not defer to the clock time. So please proceed. Thank you very much. The, dish, the, the decision reads, I'm going to enter an order or a judgment in this case because it will close the case which will direct that the voucher in question be paid by the county of Sussex. I think it's important to, to put this dispute in context. The county clerk is not simply the head of an administrative department of the county government. She is not simply an employee of the county administration. She is an official who is separately elected and who has areas of autonomy visa this the county government. Now I did not know what visa this meant so I looked that up too. And so I'm going to read that sentence again. It says she is an official who is separately elected and who has areas of autonomy, a person of equal authority of the county government. That may or may not be a good idea in terms of how one would organize the county government. I, you know, it, a good, it may be a good case from, for saying that this should be one county government and people like the county clerk should be, should be just an employee of it. They should be just a part of the executive branch in the county government and regulated like other department heads. There's a perfectly plausible argument that can be made for organizing a county clerk's office that way as simply a department in the county government and, and maybe in these modern times that would be the way to go. But the fact is that the county clerk has been created by the office that's been recognized as specifically in the state constitution and there are a number of statutory provisions that give the county clerk certain duties which she must perform regardless of normal management desires and government desires of the county governing body. In terms of the current controversy, there's a specific statute, namely NJSA 2A, excuse me, NJSA 22A colon 4-17.1, which reads as follow. Subsection A, the county treasurer shall return to the county clerk $2 of each fee received for recording, filing, and canceling of documents in the office of the county clerk. Such sums shall be returned within 10 days of receipt of the fee by the county treasurer. Monies received by the county clerk pursuit the provision of section, subsection A shall be used to upgrade and modernize the services provided by their offices, period, close quote. I've modified the statute a little bit to cut out, when I quoted from it, to cut out references to register of deeds because we don't have a register of deeds in Sussex County. The county clerk, among other things, perform functions in, the Sussex, in Sussex County that a register of deeds performs in other counties. So when we look at the language, it is clear to me that it takes $2 from the fees that's generated by the filing of every government, every document in the county clerk's office. It directs the county treasurer to take $2 of each fee and return that money to the county clerk. Then the statute directs the county clerk to use that money for certain purposes. Those purposes, quote, to upgrade and modernize the services provided by their offices. It seems to me that the statute not only gives the direction that the money be used for the pur those purposes, but by requiring that the money be returned to the clerk, the fair inference is that the statute gives the clerk the primary responsibility for deciding how the money is to be used for purposes, and it gives the clerk primary responsibility for making the determination what in fact particular expenditures would be to advance those purposes and would be proper utilization of the funds. Now we know for the variety of sensible reasons having to do with easy, safe administration and money and ready account, accountability for money, that these monies has, hasn't simply been put in a totally different account against which the county clerk herself in Sussex County draws checks. 
The county has in place an elaborate financial system with a good auditing checks and balances of good controls and there is a system for having officials of the general government actually mechanically handle the expenditures from this fund. As I understand, it would happen it, that it is, I'm reading from a transcript, so that's how it's working, that it's, it's a, there's a special account set up in a bank into which these $2 for each document is placed and it's earmarked separately but against that are drawn by the county government. I take it by the county treasurer or somebody in the treasurer's office that the checks are drawn pursuit normal county accounting and financial practices. As those practices, those practices are, are the kind of practices which are covered by NJSA 40A colon 5-17 and they envision these, they envision that because this is public money and we want public record for it and we want a good audit trail. They envision that, that a voucher would be prepared by the person who wants funds. It would be submitted through to the county fiscal officer who, the financial officer, who then review and make a recommendation and then it would eventually be presented to the county governing body and the county governing body would sign off on it the way they would do with respect to vouchers for all funds. It's perfectly sensible to use that kind of system for the mechanical management of these funds. Incidentally, I don't think it would have to be. I actually think perhaps a case could be made for having the county clerk set this up separately and actually could control it directly herself. If she did that, she, she would be required as a responsible public officer to set up good auditing practices, good bookkeeping, you know, cross-checking to make sure that the integrity of the funds were kept. But it makes per perfectly good sense to do what, in fact, the county clerk and the county government have done, have done in Sussex. And this account sets up so that the normal counting voucher is used as a manner of mechanics. But because this is a special fund with respect to which the county clerk has considerable authority, what should happen is that the treasurer, the county administrator, and the freeholder should treat vouchers which the county clerk presents as those funds in a different way. They should, they should regard these funds as largely funds subject to her control. So they should, of course, read the voucher and make, you know, see what it says and what justification it gives. But once the justification is facially appropriate, that is to say, as a matter of quick read common sense, it is arguably within the statutory grant. Once they see that, they should then approve the fund. They should not use the kind of normal discretion they would use for other county officers. You know, someone who was an actual department head of the general county government. Let me try to make that more specific in terms of this particular controversy. I realize that you could, you could argue about whether this expenditure for monies to go to a conference of a county clerk fits under the statutory rubric here or not. This is something that's going to upgrade and modernize the services. Well, it isn't an obvious upgrade in the sense that it would be if the county clerk wanted to go out and get a new computer, a filing system for deeds and mortgages, and that would, that would be an obvious upgrade, and nobody would have a problem with that. They might out argue about whether it's sensible upgrade or not, but it's clearly an upgrade, and, and the county would not have the right to decline to make the expenditure. That isn't to say that as a matter of common sense, Ms. Ackerman came in and wanted to get a particular system, somebody in the go county government knew that there was a better system and that there was already a capacity in the county to do, to do this without buying new equipment. Of course, we would expect someone in county government to say, wait a minute, Ms. Ackerman, you really don't need to spend $50,000 for this new computer gizmo you want. 
we've got a perfectly good one and we're willing to share it with you. And they, and they can, and they could, and of course, have those kinds of discussions. We would expect, we would expect the people to act sensibly and try to come up with something that made sense in the public interest. But, but for an obvious thing like a computer upgrade, if the county clerk wanted to get it and was determined that this is what she really wanted, and after she consulted with other people and talked to them and wanted to go forward with it, in my judgment, the county would simply have to, have to pay for it, even though they might not think that this is the best way to do it. In other words, they cannot exert the kind of management control that they would for a regular county employee. They would just have to see that, that, that she was within the ballpark, and once she was, if she wanted to go ahead with it, after they gave, uh, after they gave what other, whatever suggestion or objection they wanted, they would have to approve the voucher. It, was e it would be easy, as I say, if it were something like a computer system. This isn't a obvious as an upgrade, I will grant you. But on the other hand, I think a fair argument can be made that attendance at, at a conference like this with its educational component with it, it does legitimately have, or attendance at another educational program which might be more clearly and totally educational, attendance at those things I can think can fairly be characterized as part of the whole process of intellectually modernizing and upgrading the services. As long as it is it, that, that kind of plausible argument that can be made by the county clerk, and as long as she presents that the county governor, to the county governing body in judgment, they must sign off on it. So the rule is that the county government can look at it to satisfy itself that, that the proposed expenditure is broadly within the statutory range, but once it is broadly within it, as a matter of fair argument, the voucher must be paid. Even though the county government might not itself have gone for this, this particular expenditure. In today's context, I appreciate the fact that the county government, as a matter of, of its own fiscal management, is cutting down on out-of-state educational programs for employees. Not because they don't have a value. They do have a value. And frequently in the past, the county government and Sussex have set has sent its employees quite appropriate to those things. But, the, but they're going through a period of budgetary constraint, and this is not a high priority for the county government. So they have cut it out of their general employees. That's fine. But they can't impose that on the county clerk. The reality is that she has more discretion than department heads. If she determines that, that in her judgment, this is desirable, this makes sense, and it is, it is a part of upgrading and modernization of services, then the county government has to be differential to it. I leave it at that, so, you, so please submit your forms of judgment. So this is a case, um, again, with um, Hella, Helen Ackerman from the county clerk uh, versus the Board of Chosen Freeholders. I am hoping and I am seeking today some clarity uh, from the Board of Chosen Freeholders. I have been, um, I am the duly elected officer. I do have the full authority to make decisions on behalf of the Register's Office. We've been sued five times this year since I've been, uh, five times in the 18 months that I've been there. When we're sued, it is Dana Roan, the Essex County Register of Deeds and Mortgages that is on the, the summons because I am the duly elected officer who makes the decisions for the department uh, for uh, the Essex County Register's office. And so I'm here today because um, I am having a conflict and I would like to resolve it so that we can move forward with the business of the Register's office. And the delays are impeding my process and I am seeking some, uh, some clarity here and some, and some support from the Freeholder Board to resolve this matter with the county administration so we can move forward in the business of the Register's Office. Thank you. Ms. Salam. Good evening, Ms. Rohn. 
uh, when you said sued, in, are you at liberty to say sued in, for what reason, what capacity? Uh, Excuse me? Are you at liberty to say? I'm sorry. With regard to being sued. Th you, this, I, is, this, is a, this is a transcript. No, 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 no. I, your, your statement that you're being, you've been sued five times in the last 18 months. Yes. Sued by whom and for what reason? It's, it's business of the registrar's office, whether it's indexed properly, um, I mean, it's matters of deeds and mortgages. Are the, is the filing behind? I'm trying to get it exactly what The filing is no longer behind, but it was behind. Well, upon my arrival, it was 28 weeks behind. We're no longer behind. We move between the 48-hour mandate today and based on uh, the amount of mail, it can fluctuate between the 48 hours and six days. Okay. So what is the nature of the, the five lawsuits that you referenced? It's different natures, mostly indexing, improper index, not uh, completing uh, input, uh, uh, recording of uh, names to deeds and mortgages and things like that. And is that because the system, what is it in the, in the registrar's office that is off that's causing it was due suit. to clerical errors. Okay. And is it because you're not receiving the $2 per filing document, which is, I'm sure, quite cumulative in the end? What, what number are we talking about that, in terms of funds that you're not receiving? I, I have received them. I'm being, it's been impeded with me spending them. That's the problem. Processing of my... Um, my vouchers. Vouchers? Yes. So today I'm here because I, I really need this board to investigate this matter. I've sent you guys the investigation um, from the commission on invest New Jersey Commission on Investigations for County Clerks so that we can get a better clarity as to what my job is and what my role is as the register. And what is happening is that my, the business of the register is being impeded. Ms. Salam, does that conclude your question? Yes. Mr. McInerney? I think the basic issue here is that there is money in the register's budget that she is unable to expend um, because the vouchers or the hirings or whatever the issues are are not being processed at the administrative level. Is, is that more or less correct? That is correct. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. That's it. So the budget allocation, you, you, um, I came before you. You allocated the budget for the register's office. I'm not being allowed to spend it. And so that's the question on the floor today. Three elders? Rita Jones? I, 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 I may not have it exactly what she said, but it has something to deal with the monies as an independent agency of the county that we as freeholders under the clerks could set up uh, a financial world whereas this money would go because we, uh, we could, I mean, I don't have the word. The words is that we can set up a system that it does not have to go through the general population or, or the county exec or whatever because she's not a clerk or a director. She is a duly elected official. And what can we do as freeholders, as lawmakers that she works with us, as that she would not have to wind up waiting in terms of trying to get funds to run her office? This is what I'm saying. I don't know just how oh, I'm saying it correctly, but what can we do as freeholders, the freeholder board, whereas she can get the necessary fund of those $2 or whatever it is, that she can act as an administrator of her own department to get the services that is needed for um, whatever means it takes in terms of making that particular office more efficient. This is what I'm asking. Mr. McInerney? The, the process for procurement is universal throughout the county, regardless if you're a constitutional officer or not. 
the the issue simply is is that she has money in her budget that she we, we actually put I believe it's twenty seven thousand in there for printing um, before we adopted the budget and there's money in her budget that for whatever reasons she is not able to expend that's what she's saying I think what we have to do is and I will do it I will contact the administration I will find out specifically what has been submitted to the administration uh, that for whatever reason um, they do they are they are not processing if that's the case so we've got to I want to hear from both sides I'm not doubting anything that um, that we're hearing today and I, I, I before the meeting we we actually had a had a discussion about it but but let's find out specifically what those items are and let's find out what the holdup is we don't have the power to interfere with the administration we can if we're but we do have the power to appropriate funds and by appropriating those funds there it means that as long as those funds are being spent on what they were originally designed there has to be some sort of reason why why they're not being uh, vouchers or purchase orders are not being processed the monies are there for that specific purpose so unless there's some sort of uh, in the case of a hiring freeze or things along those lines i do know that in the past under the, uh, the constitutional officers when they were in disagreement with the administration had the right to sue the prosecutor's office and the uh, sheriff's office under a, what's called a bagley had had the right to sue to increase the appropriations under this situation i'm not too familiar from a legal standpoint i'm not familiar at all but i will look into it and find out what the what the discrepancies between the registrar's office and the county administration thank you freeholder bobadilla I, I just wanted to know if at this time the administration had a comment regarding this matter uh through you madam president uh, all of the matters are under review by council okay thank you Realtors. So, Mr. McInerney and uh, Real Toro. Simply that I just I I'd, I'd like to hear back, you know, not only from from you but also from the administration as to what's the hold up and and how we can just solve this issue. So I just want to say that this was a legal rendering that I read read into the record. Uh, so this particular case has already been taken into court. This is the decision. And um, I, I, I too would like to know what the holdup is from the county administration. I've submitted things more than five months ago um, to be processed. So I would like to know, it is impeding the process. I have vendors who are calling my office because they have not been paid. And so I'd like to know also what is the problem so that we can try to resolve that problem? Mr. McInerney? I just, I just wanted to question. The, the case you're referring to, though, is not specifically any case relevant to this county, is it? Or, or this is a case no. that, you, that you saw that has familiar... Um, that is correct. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. so it this is, is not Essex County. To, this is Sussex County. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so whether or not it specifically applies to this situation would have to be reviewed by our legal counsel. I, it, I have sent that. Yeah, no, I have sent yeah. this package along with the uh, New Jersey Commission of, uh, on uh, Investigations report to the county council for a legal opinion. Okay. That, too, has not been answered. Okay. Thank you very much. Builders? Uh, Ms. Salam? When did you send that to? How long ago? Uh, we sent that on uh, Thursday of last week or Monday of this week. Just mm -hmm. recently. Yes, recently. Thank you. So I just want to ensure that I'm understanding the issue um, in its totality. So the registrar's office, Ms. Roan, you're saying is a um, separate entity that has a relationship with Essex County and that you as the, as the leader that you were elected to be in the registrar's office, whenever you are uh, desiring or um, see something that you need to spend funds on for the overall function of the registrar's office that that is your right to do so and that you've been sending you've been sending um, requests for payment to the administration but the requests for payments have not been fulfilled 
That is, is that correct. correct. Everything except that I said it is in the state constitution. This is not something that Dana Rohn is making up. It was, it's in our state constitution as to what constitutional officers, <laughs> the guidelines under NJ 46. I would love for uh, the uh, Freeholder Board Council to read the law uh, that applies to my office. Mr. McInerney? Yeah, but in, in um, whether it's the county registrar's office or other offices, I'm not, and I know there's certain prerogatives that go with, with, with her office and the constitutional offices, but you still can't spend that money unless you have it in your budget. The real issue, I think, is beyond just the constitutional right. offices. It's at. the fact that the money has been appropriated, and uh, for whatever reason, if in fact there has been, we're hearing tonight that she is unable to get bills paid within that limit of appropriation. That right. is her contention, and that's what we'll look into. And Mr. McInerney, that was my second point of ensuring that I'm understanding. So when we pass the budget, we pass the budget with those items that you need to be paid out included in that. Is that correct? No, it's not. It, it, we passed a general other expense line item. Within that, there are certain categories which, are, which could read professional, non-professional, office supplies. Those, those are control accounts. They're not necessarily budget accounts from the purpose of determining whether or not you're overspending accounts. We only give one line item. That is it. Salaries and wages is one line item. Other expenses is another. As long as the department head, as well as within those controls that might be set up as a matter of policy, is within those, with, within that budget area, within that budget appropriation, they should be okay. I mean, so, certainly, certainly, the, there is controls over spending more amounts of money in certain areas than other areas, assuming that somebody has to get to the end of the year. That's to say that you can't go hire a bunch of professionals if it's going to jeopardize other areas of your, of your budget so that at the end of the year you would be over. So, Ms. Rohn, the so items I, I, that you I, sent down, are they within the budget? So, yes, they are within the budget, and, and just for purposes, clarity purposes, there are two budgets of the Register's Office. There is an operational budget, as to what Mr. McInerney just explained, that has two, the operational budget, the salary budget, and the other budget. That's the operational budget. Then there is the trust budget. And so there are two, and I determine, the duly elected officer determines the upgrades and the modernization of the register's office. So we're talking about two different um, accounts that the register office hold. Okay, so. Okay? Yes, uh, through this body, I, I am requesting that we take a look at the case law that was provided as well as finding out from the administration what the situation is as well as communicating with Ms. Rome. Um, this board has stated several times in the past uh, our support for the registrar's office and uh, what it is that you have done in that registrar's office to ensure that the filing is up to date and is no longer behind. I know that uh, quite a few of us even attended a tour in which you gave a tour of the registrar's office talking to us about the function of it and the successes that you have had over the past 18 months. And when you came before us uh, prior regarding the budget, asking for the funds that you needed to continue in your success, we also granted that. Um, I am unclear about what our jurisdiction may or may not be. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what I can say is that in the past we have given support um, for you in your work and we need time to take a look uh, with the uh, attorneys, if the attorneys can please provide a, a report in conjunction with Mr. McInerney as well as the administration, that's the most appropriate action at this time. Thank you, and, and just when, you, when you're taking a look at that, I would love for you guys to just take a look at the deficit report that I forwarded to you as to the backlog of the registrar's office, so I tried to forward it to you to give you a sense of 20 year backlog in my office and what it will take in order to, uh, to rectify those problems. And so um, it is a small report, it's three pages, but it's really explicit as to what is going on in 
and those of you who have not um, had an opportunity to, to come and to take the tour, I urge you to do so that you could understand really uh, the detail of the Register's Office. It is um, a very important office, one of value. Um, it's usually the biggest purchase that any average individual makes in his lifetime is their home, their mortgage, and their deeds. And so I think it is important that uh, those of you who have not had the time to take the time so I can walk you through and show you that it is not a simple um, clerk job. We are recorders, and it is a highly important that we do it efficiently on the behalf of the taxpayers in this county. And so um, if you don't know that there was a, there is a high rate of fraud in Excess County with mortgages and deeds. And so we have made um, an effort to do a newsletter, to do um, you know, public notices, to do what we call a road show where we're going to counties so we can teach individuals how to ensure that their property is not compromised um, by theft um, because it happens too often. And so, um, so I just ask that when you make an assessment and as you make an assessment, that you look at the, uh, the report, the deficit report. So it'll give you a sense of what has not been going on in the register's office and what needs to take place in order to rectify those problems. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to speak at this time on any issue at all? Please come forward, state your name and affiliation for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak, monitored by the clock to my right. Uh, Douglas Freeman, uh, Weekway Park Sports Authority President. Um, coming before you today to speak about the recreation contract that we have in the park. Uh, up to about now, it hasn't rained, so we've been pretty good with the 40 kids that we have. But now that it's going to rain for the next week, we continue to try to reach out to senior services, and we have yet to receive a response. Um, we're coexisting in a building that holds roughly about 100 folks. The seniors, as you know, they up in age and don't like change. So when we try to divide the building, there's a lot of attitude, and we do not want that. We want to be able to use the building together. Uh, Madam President, through your office, we're requesting a meeting with senior services so that we can all resolve this. It's only one more week left in this particular uh, program, and the kids and the seniors should be able to coexist. Um, Douglas Freeman, South Ward Chair now. Um, I would like to thank you, Madam President, for um, having the workshop for the mortgages. It's something that the citizens needed, and to have people underwater in uh, foreclosure that's something that we definitely needed that particular information, which was held in the East Orange Library. Um, we had a tragedy um, just the other day of individuals who killed their whole family because of being underwater in their house. And this information really needs to get out that you do not have to uh, harm your family or yourself, and you should you know, look at the information which was provided and it was very informative. So thank you, Freeholder, um, Madam President, and the Freeholders and the county for providing that information to the citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Are there any other members of the public wishing to speak? Good evening, Freeholders. Chris Taylor, Chief Shop Steward, IBW, Local 1158. Uh, here on behalf of our President, Deborah Marvel, and our Business Administrator, Joe Calabro, um, we're actually here to thank the administration, Mr. Taylor and Mr. Jackson. Apparently, information began disseminated, being disseminated through the county that in the new process of the mandatory direct deposits, anybody who did not have a, a specifically designated bank account would not get paid, they would not get checks, they would not get anything at all. Uh, our business manager contacted Mr. Taylor. He went through the process. Uh, I know that he is now in the negotiation uh, here, Mr. Jackson, with PNC Bank because everyone was told in the beginning, if you can't get a bank account, and believe it or not, some people just can't. They've had debt problems and things in the past. 
or some people can't afford to pay a monthly payment, that some type of check card would be issued specific for getting your money for your payroll. Ms. Lachella uh, began immediately working on that, got back to us so that we could calm the fears of the members. We wanted to put that on the record now. I uh, hear Mr. Jackson are working on it. So if you get the calls that we've been getting, you're aware that the matter is being taken care of by the administration. And I'm sure that once they've completed that process, they'll report it back to the uh, board and uh, to the, uh, all the unions involved. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to please come forward, state your name and affiliation. You'll have three minutes to speak. Monitor by the clock to my right. Um, good morning for your orders. Good morning, Madam Field. I mean, good, good evening. I apologize. I'm all over the place right now. My name is Rahami Matthews. I'm here on behalf of um, Pop Warner football team, North Brick City Lions. Um, we were kind of clueless. This is the first time we ever been here. We was kind of uh, told to come here at 7 o'clock. We thought it was like a, a single meeting. We wasn't really sure <laughs> what exactly we were here to do. But it's due to Weekway Park with the, um, the kids not having the proper um, spacing to be able to, to not just practice, but as well as have games for future reference. Um, we have a total of about 11 different teams that have been ranked inside nationally in the country um, for about the past five years, as well as we carry on a lot of our youth that progresses to Division I colleges, top parochial high schools in the big north of New Jersey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We try to keep this ongoing, but it's been like very restrictive this past year because kids will be in, you know, once the, once the fall comes, a lot of these kids don't even, you know, there's no lights in a lot of the fields. And we were, we put our paperwork in as far as for permits and to, to be able to practice on a new turf field in Weekway Park. But we haven't got any responses to what, you know, to, to exactly what's going on after the ribbon cut, which was done, if I'm not mistaken, about two weeks ago, correct? About two weeks ago, we still haven't received a response for anything. And that's what we were here today for to kind of figure out like, exactly what do we do next? Because we don't have nowhere to put these kids as far as for the season to come. Yes, thank you. And there is a letter being prepared. And it's to my understanding that the director in Parks is working on the issue. Um, Madam Clerk, I'll defer to you. And that was for Doug Freeman regarding the senior citizens. This is the first we're hearing from him, this young man. Okay. Was a different, his is a different issue. Okay, did you contact someone already? Um, yeah, we um, contacted the permits for the park through, through the county and stuff, and nobody's gave a response. Um, we always heard we were the first person to actually put the paperwork in. Yeah. Nobody's responded to us yet. Yeah, so today is, today is your lucky day. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Salvante, uh, if you could please come forward and meet this gentleman. This is our parks director, Dan Salvante. And uh, I can, uh, Madam Chair, I can answer a couple of those questions right now. Um, Dan Salvante, director of the Essex County Park System. You can imagine right now there are numerous applications that have come forward for the utilization of the fields in Week Wake Park. We're trying to sort it out because there's certain time restrictions on certain organizations. Uh, some of the schools that utilize the, the fields for high school uh, games have to be played at certain times. So we're trying to do a master schedule and kind of fill in all the spots that are available for all the organizations that are looking to use it. All right, sir, did you get that? Yes. yes. Not really, because yes. Kyle was speaking. <laughs> Mr. Salvante, can you please come forward and just say that again real quick? Dan Salvante, again, what we're currently doing is developing a master schedule with all the organizations that have put in requests to utilize the, utilize the field. Keep in mind the school vocational school will be using that site as well so therefore there are time restrictions when they can be there and when they can play based on the leagues that they participate in so once we get the master schedule we will then turn around and put slots where some of the organizations uh, can fit so I am not going to be able to meet everybody's need but we'll do the best so everybody gets a piece of the field thank you very much mr. Salvante <laughs> Are there any other members of the public wishing to speak at this time? Mr. Wadu? Yes, yeah, citizen.
that Essex County did one of the beautiful things you ever want to see when they put that field in Weequick Park. We have people flying over, jumping out with no parachute, trying to get on it. <laughs> we have a, teams with two, what I think is 280 some kids that's dying to play. They sneak on at night. They sneak on in the day. And if school would be in, they'd be sneaking out of school. Because during certain times at Wheatwick Park, nobody's on the field. We had it Monday night. Nobody on the field all day, except 7 o'clock in the morning, Essex County College uh, soccer team, the girls in the men, practice there. Then we have another football team that practices, kind of gorillas type. They go anyhow. This particular team has a permit down on the soccer field, almost, well, shall we say, on Friedelheisen Avenue. And it's bad for them to play on grass and things, and you have a brand new field. They need a spot. For the last five years, they haven't had a home. And right now, Weequick Park looks very good to everybody, not just the football teams, the soccer teams, the track teams. It looks good to everybody, even to the citizens in this particular area. They come. I caught one of the freeholders on it the other morning around 6 o'clock. Which one was it, Mr. Wadu? What? Which one was it? Which one was it? <laughs> well, may I? Libby Jones. <laughs> she's out there at 6.30 in the morning. You know, and she's in Irvington. She came all the way down from Irvington to get on it. But, you know, this is what we have. Some, some kind of uh, uh, process to move this up. Now, I know... Mr. Cervante, he's going to take as much time as he can. We know that the Essex County schools have first priority. We know that Essex County has a priority. But then the Week Wake Park Sports Authority has a priority because we are pulling people in with teams. Thank you, Mr. Wadu. All right. State your name and affiliation for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Yes, my name is Robert Carpenter, and I live in, <coughs> excuse me, I live in Irvington. And uh, last week for last, I talked to Mr. Wadu about it. I had my niece, she was here from North Carolina, she went to run, so I told her I'd take her out in the park. And I'm in the park every day for the last 20 to 25 years playing golf or something. And I've seen the worst condition, and I don't know who the director is, but he's definitely not doing his job. Mm -hmm. When you walk around that park, it's so condensed. I told Mr. Wadu, some lady going to get raped or killed out there. Walking around that park, it's so bad you can't even see from here to you. Just get up and go out there and you'll see it. That's all I have to say. He's definitely not doing his job. Cause he must be in his office wherever he at. <laughs> where, where in the park are you referring to? Go around the track, around the whole around the lake. Around the lake. Yeah. And it's so bad, you wouldn't even walk around there. Is it the foil? You wouldn't want your kid to walk around and ask Mr. Wadu. He know. I went up there and I said something to him. And he said he would get the guy to say something about it. I said something before with bad condition. They sit in the office, they don't do nothing. Mm -hmm. I told a guy up at Bottle Stroke where I play I work up there. I said how bad a condition. He said, Well, they're not doing the job. Somebody needs to complain. That's all I have to say. I'm definitely not doing the job. Thank you. Please state your name and affiliation. I'm a Ray Cowboy, uh, uh, district leader of 48, weak wave section, Dayton Street. And I wanted to say a lot of things, but from what I've been hearing tonight, it just 
brings me back to where I started from to what I was talking about, the tree problem that we have in the park, and I haven't seen anybody trimming the trees and branches. And, and being a district leader, I'm, I'm being told uh, a lot of problems now, and I didn't know that I was getting into this type of thing being a district leader, I'm hearing all the problems of Weekway Park and all the district of Dayton Street and all the areas. But I wanted to say that branches have been falling behind the wind and the storm. All I've asked is uh, trimming the trees and uh, taking care of that problem around the, uh, the park, which has been ever since I have come here speaking on those things. And I've gotten letters saying you spoke to people but I don't know who you're speaking to, but they're not doing the job that they're supposed to be doing, trimming the trees. And I spoke on the porta parties that uh, I said uh, behind that track out there in the field there's, is, has doubled and tripled the amount of people around there. And I know they're not going home, and I know they're not coming all the way from over the track up to the, uh, the, to the uh, uh, 92, uh, uh, house up there where they have the, the section, but they closing that at 6 o'clock, and they have the kids playing there at, at till the 7 o'clock. Then they have the basketball that's played up until 10 o'clock, and there's no porta parties around there. There's only three in the entrance of the place, and it's, it's, it's a shame the way I see things is happening. Now, the guy broke his, uh, a limb, had broken off and broke his back glass, and he, he, he wanted to know if he can be some kind of restitution because I've been telling him about the trimming of the trees along Dayton Street. Something's got to be done about it, and I don't want to just hear that you're reporting it to the proper authorities and just telling me that there's three porta parties being put in it. That's not going to do it. And I, I feel that, that, that the administration, uh, whoever it is, is not doing his job the way that they're supposed to do it, or something would, be, would happen better than what it's gone. I appreciate uh, the, just the speaking tonight, and I hope that uh, something will be done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Silvante, I hope you have a pen and a pad. Um, as you know, members of the, the community come before us from Wheatway Park and other parks um, just about every time we have a meeting to let us know what's going on in the parks. And if I'm understanding the issue correct, I believe that around the track there's overgrown foliage, which makes it difficult to see. And Mr. Cowboy has come before our board several times to talk about the trimming back of the trees. So I request that um, through myself as president of this body to please just maybe take a second look at it. I do know that Mr. Savante is in the parks quite often. In fact, he is uh, catching up to me as far as a tan um, <laughs> because he is, he is going around in parks and there's a reason that Weekway Park looks so beautiful and that is because the ever presence of uh, Essex County staff uh, constantly wanting to make sure that we get it right. But getting everything right doesn't always happen and that's why we rely on the citizens to come before us to tell us what it is that they need so we thank you for coming before us mr Salvanti, if you could please look into all those issues including the porta potties um, everyone who spoke will receive a letter of response in the mail and uh in the response we do receive back from mr Salvanti's office and i i said before that it was your lucky day i don't believe in luck i believe in blessings so you're you, you know, Mr. Salvante is here tonight and he's actually heard your concerns directly. Are there any other members of the public wishing to speak at this time? Okay. We're going to close public comment session. Madam Clerk, do we have any ordinances um, on introduction and first reading? Madam President, uh, we have none. Okay, do we have any ordinance or resolutions for listing purposes only? Madam President, we have none. Do we have any ordinances and resolutions on second reading and public hearing tonight? Madam President, we have six. Uh, okay. The first um, ordinance is ordinance number 0-2016-00017, salary ordinance, County of Essex, 2016 and 2017. 
Okay, I hereby declare the public hearing on Ordinance 0 2016 0 open. If there's any member of the public wishing to comment for or against this ordinance, please come forward and you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay. Uh, freeholders, do you have any questions or comments? Mr. McInerney? No. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Do I have a motion and second to close the public hearing on ordinance 0-2016-00017? Move it. By Freeholder Richardson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Freeholder Bobadilla. Roll call. Um, do I have the same mover and a second to approve this ordinance? Yes. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Freeholder Toro. Yes. Freeholder Siebel? Yes. Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Johnson? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. <coughs> Madam Clerk, can you please read the next ordinance? Ordinance O. 2016-0018, an ordinance appropriating $1,090,000 by the County of Essex for the acquisition of various capital equipment. I hereby declare the public hearing on Ordinance 0 2016 open. If there's any member of the public wishing to comment for or against this ordinance, please come forward. Madam Clerk, let the record reflect there's no member of the public wishing to come forward. Ms. Salam, do you have any questions or comments? None. Mr. McInerney? None. Freeholders? Do I have a mover and a second to close public hearing? Move it. Moved by Freeholder Jones. Is there a second? Second. Second by Freeholder Richardson. Is the same mover and second wish to take this ordinance? Yes. Okay, roll call, Madam Clerk. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Johnson? Yes. Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Luciano, absent Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Siebel? Yes. Freeholder Toro? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Uh, Madam President, uh, just for the record, I need to indicate that on the uh, roll call for Ordinance 0 2016 0017, I need uh, to indicate that uh, Freeholder Luciano is absent. Thank you. Please read the next ordinance. Ordinance number 0 2016 0019, naming the 10th and the 11th holes at Essex County Weequake Golf Course as the Wiley Williams Corner in honor of Essex County golfing legend Wiley Williams. Okay. Uh, Ms. Salam? No questions. Mr. McInerney? No questions. Freeholders? I hereby declare the public hearing on Ordinance 0 2016 open. If there's any member of the public who would like to comment for or against this ordinance, please come forward, state your name and affiliation. Do you have a mover and a second to close public, the public hearing? Moved by Freeholder Johnson. Second by Freeholder Jones. Do I have the same mover and a second to approve the ordinance? Yes. Yeah. Okay, roll call, Madam Clerk. Freeholder Toro? Yes. Freeholder Siebel? Yes. Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Luciano absent? Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Johnson? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Please move to the next ordinance and read. Ordinance number 0-2016-00020, naming the rubberized track in Essex County Wasesson Park as the Essex County Horace. Uh, Ashen Felter track in honor of the 1952 gold medalist Horace Ashen Felter III. Okay. I hereby declare the public hearing on Ordinance 0 2016 -00020 open. If there's any member of the public wishing to comment for or against this ordinance, please come forward, state your name and affiliation. Madam Clerk, let the record reflect. There's no member of the public wishing to comment for or against this ordinance. Mr. McInerney, do you have any questions? None. Ms. Salam? None. Freeholders? Do I have a motion and a second? I'll move it. Moved by second. Freeholder Siebold, second by Freeholder Toro. Will the same mover and second yes. like yes. to approve this ordinance? Uh, roll call, Madam Clerk. 
Frielda Bobadilla? Yes. Frielda Vice President Gill? Yes. Frielda Johnson? No, he's absent. Frielda Jones? Yes. Frielda Luciano? Absent. Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Frielda Siebel? Yes. Frielda Toro? Yes. Frielda President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Okay. Thank you. Please move to the next ordinance. Ordinance number 02016-00021 to establish Essex County electronic fees for the Office of the Registrar of, of, of Deeds and Mortgages. Okay. I hereby declare the public hearing on Ordinance 02016-00017 open. If there's any member of the public who would like to comment for or against this ordinance, Please come to the microphone, state your name and affiliation for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Madam Clerk, let the record reflect. There's no member of the public wishing to speak at this time. Mr. McInerney, do you have any questions? No questions, Madam Clerk. Ms. Salam, do you have any questions? No questions. Freeholders, do you have any questions? Do you have a mover and a second to close public hearing? Move it. Moved by Freeholder Toro, second by Freeholder Richardson. Do I have the same mover and a second to approve? Yes. Okay, roll call, Madam Clerk. Friel de Toro? Yes. Friel de Siebel? Yes. Friel de Richardson? Yes. Friel de Luciano? Absent. Friel de Jones? Yes. Friel de Johnson? Absent. Friel de Vice President Gill? Yes. Friel de Bobadilla? Yes. Friel de President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Please uh, read the next ordinance. Uh, ordinance number 0-2016-00022 for the release of reverter rights with respect to certain property and improvements located in the city of Newark, Essex County, New Jersey, known as the Bears and Eagle Riverfront Stadium. Okay. I hereby declare the public hearing open on O ordinance O 2016-00022. Two, two, open. If there's any member of the public wishing to comment for or against this ordinance, please come forward. Mr. McInerney, do you have any questions? Ms. Salam, do you have any questions? None. Freeholders, do you have any questions? Okay, do I have a mover and a second I'll move to second. close public hearing? Moved by Freeholder Seabolt, second by Freeholder Bobadilla. Do I have the same mover and a second to approve yes. it? Yes. All right. Uh, roll call, Madam Clerk. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Johnson, absent. Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Luciano, absent. Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Seabolt? Yes. Freeholder Toro? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let's move to. Let's actually move up some, some resolutions. We're gonna take uh, resolutions 10 through 14. Okay. Res read. Resolutions 10, Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs, authorization to use the Essex County Recreation and Open Space Trust Fund uh, to fund tree maintenance at Cedar Grove Park in the amount not to exceed $60,000. Resolution 11. Uh, Department of Public Works, Recreation and Cultural Affairs, authorization to use the Essex County Recreation and Open Space Trust Fund for a local aid award to the Community Foundation of New Jersey for the renovation of the first landing party of Founders of New York, statue in the amount not to exceed 35000 Resolution 12, Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs, authorization to use the Essex County Recreation Open Space Trust Fund to fund solid waste pick up throughout the Essex County Park System in the amount not to exceed $387,944. Resolution 13, Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs, contract award to T. Farsi and Sons, uh, direct waste services, the lowest responsive and responsible bidder to provide collection, transportation, and disposal of ID 10 solid waste, to your agreement, amount not to exceed $387,943.52. Resolution 14, Department of Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs, contract award to the four lowest responsive and responsible bidders per item on a unit cost basis to furnish and deliver pesticides, fertilizer, grass seed, and sod products, 12 month agreements, amount not to exceed $200,000. Mr. Chalala? Uh, yes, Resolution 10 is. Uh Authorization from the Open Space Trust Fund uh, to add $60,000 for 
tree maintenance at the new City Grove Park. Resolution 11 is a grant to the Community Foundation of New Jersey who will coordinate the restoration of the first landing party statue in Newark. Uh, this is being uh, done in conjunction with the celebration of Newark's 350th anniversary. Uh, resolution 12 is the approval of funding uh, for solid waste pickups throughout our park system. Resolution 13 is the actual contract for solid waste pickup, a two-year agreement uh, throughout our park system. Uh, we do have the vendor with us this evening. And finally, Resolution 14 is uh, four, four awards to the lowest responsible bidders on a unit cost basis for various pesticides, fertilizers, grass seed, and sod products. This is a 12-month contract, uh, not to exceed $200,000. Not one of the vendors will approach the uh, $100,000 figure. And this is products for our three golf courses. Okay. Would you like to invite the um, vendor up? Yes. For, will the representative from uh, T. Fries come to the mic? Good evening, free holders. My name is Michael Spurduto. I'm uh, Director of Sales for T. Fries Direct Waste. Thank you. Please tell us a bit about the contract. Um, it's a solid waste contract uh, servicing the containers located inside the parks. Um, a company, our company ourselves has been in business since 1947. Uh, we do multiple municipal contracts and county contracts with schools, Rutgers University being one of them, NJIT, um, UMDMJ. Um, and some uh, local municipalities. We pick up all of Essex Fells uh, uh, residents there for solid waste. I myself have 30 years experience in the business doing municipalities. The owner of the companies has about 40 years doing uh, municipalities. Um, this is something we're very familiar with and, uh, and it seems to be uh, just a simple job for us. We do employ approximately 70% of our employees are Essex County residents. Um, about 80% of them are minority. Um, and you know, the, the equipment that we provide is you know, up to date in terms of you know, uh, emission standards and so forth. So you know, we keep rotating the equipment periodically throughout you know, a period of like three to five years, the equipment. And uh, this is a contract to empty the waste cans Correct. Parks. Free orders. Free auditorial. Now, does that this contract include for the recycling bins, or is that not? I not didn't part see of this the. Contract? I believe this is just for the solid waste. Just for the solid waste. Mm -hmm. Free orders. Have you had a contract with the county before? I believe so. Yes. Okay, so uh, this contract here was previously done by you all, or? I believe this is brand new. This is a, this is a new venture for the county. Mr. Silvanti, will you come forward? Dan Silvante, director of the Essex County Park System. Madam Chair, this is a uh, new contract um, to be utilized in the Essex County Park System. Okay. How was it done before? Uh, currently, the Essex County Maintenance Division has two vehicles. Uh, and we're able to uh, run them through the park system roughly <coughs> six times a week. When I say six times a week, that's Monday through Friday and one day on a weekend, most of the time on a Sunday. Um, due to our fleet, uh, our vehicles are approximately 15 years old. We only have two, so it does create a problem when one breaks down. Uh, and it's quite impossible for us with only two vehicles uh, to actually hit all 27 locations on a Monday coming off a weekend. And you can imagine on a Sunday, we can't get to all 27 after a Saturday. Um, this gives us tremendous flexibility. Uh, the way the contract was written up, uh, the most largest parks, Brook, uh, Branchbrook, Week Wake, um, those parks will be picked up five times a week, uh, which will include weekend services, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and Monday. So we've looked at our trash operation where the heaviest trash is generated. Uh, is normally from a Friday to a Monday. We also have pickups during the week. 
Uh, but those larger parks will be able to get into those parks now five times a week. So we've looked at our park system. The most active parks will receive that five times. Other parks are four times. Other parks are three times. Reservation, I believe, is twice or three times. But we've taken a look at the entire park system, what, where and how the garbage is generated. And a lot of it is generated from that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday time slot. Uh, and again, some of the complaints that we do receive is we don't get to a park on Monday because when we were doing it in-house, just based on the amount of equipment we have and the locations we got to, it was impossible for us. This will enable the vendor to get to those parks on a more frequent basis and eliminate some of those trash abatement issues that we have in the system. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear it, Mr. Savanti, because where I was going with the question, um, was that there, you know, sometimes whenever I go into the park, there seems to be trash over, but you answered that question as to why, because you guys hadn't had an opportunity to hit it. So I will expect more than from this since we have a contract now and it's being done outside of the, the normal in-house um, procedure. So I expect the parks to be spotless. Please, if they lift out a bag, Okay, in Orange Park, if they lift out a bag, if it falls out, I expect them to pick up the something and to put it in the trash, you know, the truck or whatever it is, mm -hmm. okay? And then also to return the bins back to the little garbage cages. Correct. Because with, without that, what happens is the wind blows and if there's a pond or something, now the trash can is in the middle of the pond. <coughs> Thank you. Brother what's, Bobadilla? Uh, what's the effective date of this contract? September 1. <laughs> they should have seen that. But thank you. Freelders? Okay. Freelders Seawalt. Freelders Seawalt. Thank you. Uh, these items were discussed at length before the Open Space Trust Fund Advisory Board. And we were particularly pleased with resolution number 11 because the uh, the statue, the first landing part of the founders of Newark, was done by Gutson Borglum, who is well known for creating Mount Rushmore. And for some reason, it's probably been about 15 years that this statue disappeared and it ended up in the parking lot of the Newark Division of Traffic and Signalization and it was partially covered in tarp and sitting on a broken pallet when it was rediscovered. The statue is going to be refurbished and its rededication coincides with Newark 350 celebration. And I understand that it's going to be placed on a property that belongs to NJ Pack in Newark. So we're going to see a magnificent statue which will be presented in the near future. So we were, the Open Space Trust Fund uh, Advisory Board was very pleased to hear this and we're also pleased with the other resolutions before us tonight. Thank you. Three others? Okay, Mr. Chalala? Uh, I think that was 10 through 14, Madam President. Okay. Uh, do I have a mover and a second to take I'll 10 through it. 14? Move by Freeholder Sipo. Is there a second? Second. Second by Freeholder Bobadilla. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Freeholder Toro? Yes. Freeholder Sebo? Yes. Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Luciano, absent. Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Johnson? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Resolution number 14, Mr. Chalala, was there no vendor? Uh, no, since not one vendor will uh, broach the $100,000. Okay. You can go back. All right. All right. We're going to move to resolution 16 through 22. 
Madam Clerk, please read. Resolution 16, uh, 2016 County Budget Insertion of Items of Revenue from the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority for uh, fiscal year 2017, uh, sub-regional transportation planning program, Department of Public Works, $132,966. Resolution 17, uh, 2016, budget insertion of items of revenue from the state of New Jersey, Department of Labor and Workforce Development for Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Adult and Dislocated Worker, Department of Economic Development, Training and Employment, $2,224,169. Resolution 18, 2016, County Budget Insertion of Items of Revenue from the State of New Jersey, Department of Labor and Workforce Development for Workforce Innovation, Opportunity, uh, Opportunity Act Youth, Department of Economic Development, Training and Employment, $1,056,053. Resolution 19. 2016 County Budget Insertion of Items of Revenue from the State of New Jersey, Department of Labor and Workforce Development for Smart Steps, Department of Economic Development, Training and Employment, $24,075. Resolution 20, 2016 County Budget Insertion of Items of Revenue from the State of New Jersey, Department of Labor and Workforce Development for Workforce Learning Link, Department of Economic Development, Training and Employment, $104,000, Resolution 21, 2016, County Budget Insertion of Items of Revenue from the State of New Jersey, Department of Labor and Workforce Development for Workforce New Jersey, Department of Economic Development, Training and Employment, $9,975,388, Resolution 22, 2016, County Budget Insertion of Item of Revenue from the Department of Law and Public Safety for Fiscal Year 2016, Drive sober or get pulled over. Office of the Sheriff, five thousand dollars. Thank you, Mr. Talala. Uh, resolution sixteen is a uh, a grant uh, for the transportation planning program. Uh, this is the same funding the county has received uh, last year from last year, and it's to support the training and transportation planning activities for the county. Resolution 17 is an insertion of revenues um, for, by the Department of Labor. This is to provide for all our workforce development services to eligible Essex County residents, job training, vocational training, employment, and core services. Uh, there is an increase of about $108,000 this year, and that increase is purely driven by a change in the state formula. Resolution 18, insertion of revenue, again from the Department of Labor. This is for core and intensive services to assist residents in acquiring vocational and employment skills. Uh, this, however, is a $47,000 decrease, again based on state formulas. Resolution 19, insertion of revenues by the Department of, from the Department of Labor. Um, this is to provide for counseling as well as administrative costs associated with the uh, Smart Steps program. Uh, the county is receiving an additional uh, $7,425 under this program. Uh, there had been additional funding that was uh, granted for the, uh, uh, by the state under this program. Resolution 20, insertion of revenues from the Department of Labor. Uh, these funds are to provide for an adult literacy uh, services to eligible Essex County residents. It also includes ESL, uh, ABE, and other workplace skills. Uh, the county is uh, fortunate to receive an additional $29,000 in this allocation. And again, it's based on an increased uh, state formula. Uh, resolution 21, uh, revenues from the state of uh, New Jersey Department of Labor for various uh, temporary assistance for the uh, needy families commonly known as TANF as well as assistance for the general assistance population as well as the supplemental nutritional assistance program uh, formerly known uh, as food stamps currently called SNAP. 
Uh, the county is uh, fortunate to receive an additional $293,000 $277 in these funds this year, uh, primarily based on uh, increased state formula funds. Uh, resolution 22, insertion of revenues. Again, this is from the Department of Law and Public Safety. Um, we are receiving an additional $1,000. This is for education enforcement to help reduce drunk driving uh, on Labor Day crackdown August 19th through September 5th. And that is 16 through 22, Madam President. Mr. McInerney? No questions on these. These are all uh, you know, budget insertions that have no fiscal impact on the county. Ms. Salam? No questions. Three holders. Do you have any questions or comments? Okay. Do I have a mover and a second? Move it. To take 16 through 22. Move <coughs> moved by, I think that was moved by Freeholder Bobadilla. Right. Second by Freeholder Johnson. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Okay. <coughs> Freeholder Bobadilla. Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill. Yes. Freeholder Johnson. Yes. Freeholder Jones. Yes. Freeholder Luciano absent. Freeholder Richardson. Yes. Freeholder Siebel. Yes. Freeholder Toro. Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake. Yes. So moved. Thank you. Uh, now let's move to resolutions number one through three. <coughs> resolution one. Is withdrawn by administration. Resolution two, advise and consent nomination for the reappointment of John <coughs> F. Jack Kane, Jr. to the Essex County uh, Veterans Advisory Board. Uh, resolution three, advise and consent nomination for the reappointment of Marcy Thompson to the Essex County Advisory Board for the Arts. Mr. Chalala? Uh, resolution two is the uh, reappointment of John Jack Kane to the uh, Veterans Advisory Board. Uh, his term will run through uh, 6 30 19. If I could call Mr. Kane up to the microphone to introduce himself. Uh, Madam President, I think he was here. I, I don't know if he stepped out or. Call the next person up. Uh, next president, uh, <clears throat> Marcy Thompson, um, <clears throat> for the advisory board on the arts. Ms. Thompson. They got tired of waiting. <coughs> they got tired of waiting. I think she stepped out as well, Madam President. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Jackson. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Madam President. I, I think both resume. of them. I think both stepped out. If, if there's okay. a, we can. So let's move to uh, resolutions four and five. Please read. Resolution four, Department of Corrections contract award to Prospect um, E.G. I mean, EOGH to provide a secure hospital medical unit for inpatient outpatient services for inmates, five year agreement, amount not to exceed $9 million. Resolution five, Department of Corrections, contract award to Cooks Direct Incorporated, the lowest responsive and responsible bidder to provide food food warmers for the correctional facility 60 day agreement, amount not to exceed $212,955.35. Mr. Jackson. Madam President, uh, these two items, uh, Director Ortiz and the vendors are here to discuss them. I'd like them to come up. Please come forward, Mr. Ortiz. Good evening, Madam President. Al Ortiz, Director of County Correctional Facility. On this particular agenda item, we are in dire need of these food carts because the one that we've had 
for many years now have served their service life and it's, it's detrimental to where from the main kitchen area where the food is prepped and cooked we get it to the destination in a warm and sanitary manner um, I would recommend highly that this particular um, request be honored thank you please come forward state your name and affiliation uh, John Yeager and I'm the business development manager for Cooks Direct uh, we will be the uh, distributor that will be uh, providing these carts to the county um, we will be uh, getting them from the vendor FWE they are the ones that were specified on this bid and we were providing the specified card at the bid we uh, submitted thank you uh, if I may madam president this is just for the record, this is for 43 units at uh, $4,952. 4,952 each. Okay, Mr. McInerney. Are, are you the actual vendor that's supplying these? Uh, we are the distributor. The the vendor that's building the carts is FWE. Okay, so who's our who is our contract with? Is it's it with us, Cooks Direct. Okay, so you're you're bringing or you're buying. Yes, well, we are not the manufacturer of the carts. Right. We're the distributor. But our relationship, our contract is with you. Directly with us, correct. Anything wrong with the carts, we're going to call you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I was confused there. It was, uh, number. Okay. I'm sorry. So this is for this is for Cooks. Correct. Okay. Three others. Any questions or comments? For resolution five, I, I have one This is for sixty days. Well, it's a one-time purchase, so okay. we'll, we'll fulfill the order within the sixty days. Okay. And yeah. then the individuals pushing the carts are from the staff themselves. Our right. inmates and detainees that we utilize for that purpose. Okay. Thanks. So the carts are electronic. No, they're. There is there a heated ambient cart. One side of the cart is heated to keep food warm. The other side is ambient. Um, so they can be plugged into the, you know to an outlet, um, but they're not. An inmate will have to, or a correctional officer, paying on the facility, will have to maneuver the carts. Uh, Director Ortiz was about to say something. No, um, we have one inmate a piece per cart, and the cart is locked. So it leaves from the kitchen area secured. They push it up where other inmates with an officer supervising them will get it into the pantry and put it on the steam tables for eventual service. So it's continually warm, or the salads on one side are kept at an ambient temperature. Mr. McInerney? Uh, and uh, obviously there's some sort of warranty on these? Uh, correct. How much is the warranty? Uh, the warranty is six months. Okay. You, uh, can you please state again for the record how much each cart costs? Each cart is uh, $4,952.45. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Freeholders, creditor? What is the uh, expected life of the carts? Well, in the correctional environment, it, you know, it's, that's a tough one to call. These particular carts, I would say somewhere between seven and ten years. How many, uh, how many servings do, do the carts actually hold? So how many plates, trays, how many inmates one cart passes through are going to get fed? The, the carts themselves are about my height, right. and when you open it up, it has multiple uh, shelves, so you can put a two-inch pan, a four-inch pan, depending what it is. We actually feed one unit or two, depending if they're side by side. We can actually feed out of enough pans to get in there to put on the steam table and ultimately service. So it, it, it can feed 64, it can feed 84, depending on how it's put in there. Thank you. My, my question is, how were we doing it before? Allerty's director, the ones that we had have had their day in the sun. They've, um, 
they're, they're, they're not working, you can't heat them, they, you can't get parts for them, the wheels on the bottom are wearing off, and it's just, we just need to replace them, you know, we have to keep food at a certain temperature, it's just wear and tear. And, and how old were those units, that, the previous units? I've been there for 10 years, and they've been there the whole time I've been there. Um, Mr. Freeholder, through you, uh, Madam President, about 12 years old. Right, that's what Freeholders? Okay. And for resolution number four, Mr. Jackson? Uh, yes, Madam President. This is a five-year agreement with the um, for a hospital medical unit uh, with Prospect EOGH, and again, uh, Director Ortiz is here to do to discuss that. Madam President, Al Ortiz, Director, Correctional Facility. Um, this particular contract is a five-year contract for the continuation of what we have been doing with the special unit where we house our inmates and detainees and some other partner members of ours, but this is strictly for the Essex County inmates. Um, this is also for the outpatient services that are received at the East Orange, so it's a combination of both. Thank you. Please come forward, state your affiliation, and tell us a bit about the contract. Suzette Robinson, Vice President of Ancillary Services for East Orange General Hospital. Please tell us a bit about the contract. I'm sorry, Madam President. The contract. Oh, the contract. Uh, we've, um, as, as you probably all know, we have uh, been in a contract with Essex County um, for many years, and we've been in partnership with, with them providing um, inpatient and outpatient services. Um, it's been going very well for the county and, and for East Orange General Hospital. Um, and we would like to continue to serve that um, need and that purpose for the Essex County uh, Correctional Facilities. We also, through that contract, have multiple other contracts with other counties, um, which has really helped the hospital financially over the years. And of course, um, the um, correctional facilities as well. Thank you. Mr. McInerney? Um, this contract has roughly, I believe, it's somewhere in the range of a 2% increase each year. There is a, um, a detailed, some of a detailed analysis as to the individual charges with regard to a CT or an MRI or ultrasounds. Uh, there is um, an issue with one of the numbers there that I approached with um, the director, which he's going to get back to me on, but certainly everything else is in order here to move forward. Thank you. Ms. Salam? No question. Free elders? Free auditor? For the record, I didn't see it in the documentation. What's the funding source? The county budget. County budget. Yeah. The Operating budget. Operating. Operating. Yeah. Okay. Free elders? Do you have a mover and a second to take resolutions four and five? I'll move it. Moved by free elder Seabolt. Second. Second by free elder Tor. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Johnson? Yes. Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Luciano, absent Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Sebal? Yes. Freeholder Toro? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Okay, let's go back to resolution two and three. Mr. Chalala? Uh, Madam President, we're going to have to reschedule. Both of them? Yes. All right. Uh, so we're going to adjourn resolutions two and three. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I think you have to pick two to a date. You have to have a date. Two. I think we'll adjourn, we'll adjourn to a date. The next freeholder board meeting, which will be August 24th. Do you have a mover and a second? Move by, who said that? Freeholder Vice President Gill. Second by Freeholder Johnson. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Freeholder Toro. Yes. Freeholder Siebel. Yes. Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Luciano? Absent Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Johnson? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. Thank you. Please. So moved. Thank you. Please come forward, state your name, affiliation, and tell us a bit about the contract. 
Please move to resolutions number six through nine and read. Resolution six, Department of Public Works, Division of Engineering, contract change order with the new Prince uh, Concrete Construction Company to provide <coughs> construction services for South Orange Avenue traffic operations and roadway improvements. Additional amount <coughs> not to exceed $667,300. $16.01, Resolution 7, Department of Public Works, Division of Fleet Management, contract award to the two lowest responsive and responsible bidders per item on a unit cost basis to provide auto and light truck parts, 24-month agreement, aggregate amount not to exceed $400,000. Resolution 8, Department of Public Works, Division of Engineering, amendment to shared services agreement between Hudson County and Essex County for the operations, maintenance, and repairs of Bridge Street, Clay Street, and Jackson Street bridges spanning the Passaic River between the two counties. A resolution nine, Department of Public Works, Division of Engineering, contract award to air systems maintenance, the lowest responsive and responsible bidder to provide general EP and H. Uh, HVAC services at various <laughs> county facilities, one year agreement, not amount not to exceed $443,121. Okay. Mr. Shalala? Uh, resolution 6, uh, this is the South Orange Avenue S-curve project. Uh, there is a, a need for a change order for additional quantities needed to complete the project. Um, the additional uh, Funds to complete the project will be coming from the federal government under a capital grants funds program. And we do have the representative uh, from the company with us this evening. Please come forward. Good evening. I'm uh, John Maisano with New Prince Concrete Construction Company. Uh, we're an SBE company out of Hackensack who's been uh, working the past. Uh, almost two years on the uh, South Orange Avenue improvements. Can you please tell us about the contract? Sorry? Tell us about the contract. The, the contract was a, a almost $26 million pro, uh, contract to, uh, you know, realign the uh, S-curves from Melbourne all the way down through to South Orange Avenue, I mean, to South Orange. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McInerney? No questions. Freeholders? Freeholder Seabolt? Thank you. When do you anticipate that the entire project will be finished? The, we've reached substantial completion. Um, there's, uh, well, the punch list is done. The project is pretty much completed. We're just uh, doing final paperwork, final as built quantities. Uh, I would figure within a month. Within a month? Yeah, I, I would figure that, yeah. Yeah, because I use the road all the time and I see that it is pretty much completed. Yep. So within a month, within a month it should be all finished? Yep. Very good, thank you. Freelda <coughs> Jones? Uh, is this the first time you've ever done this type of work for Essex County in terms of the improvements from Milburn to? For Essex County, uh, we've done work in the past, but um, I don't know. My name is Pasquale Baisano. I'm the president of the firm. I've been in business for 48 years doing DOT, Parkway, Turnpike, New Jersey Transit, counties all over the state. So we've done all of this type of work all of these years. Okay, my concern, Madam um, President, is that um, they have been doing this work for which is $26 million, and then today we need an additional over half a million dollars to complete. Why would they so far reached from the original amount that went for the bid? That, that's the only thing I, my concern is. You know, the answer right. to that concern and that question? Uh, through you, Madam President, uh, on a project of this size and nature, it's actually less than 3%. Uh, when you do a project of this nature, uh, the exact quantities uh, can vary, uh, and this is what this resolution speaks to, is to address the additional quantities uh, necessary to complete the project. Uh, and uh, this has all been approved by the 
federal government under their capital grant program. Uh, as you know, the, the feds are funding this entire program uh, from design to implementation to, to construction. So if I'm hearing correctly, there, is, there are no additional um, expenses due to the county? There were never. There were. There, there were, were never federal, additional. There were all federal funds, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Realtors. Realtor Richardson. The union shop. Yes. Thank you. Realtors. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chalala. Uh, resolution seven. Uh, Division of Fleet Management award to two of the lowest responsible, responsible bidders on a lowest cost basis to provide for auto and light truck parts. A uh, 24 month contract. We have with us this evening a representative from DS Automotive, uh, and uh, we also have a representative from uh, Samuels Inc., commonly known as Bywise Auto Parts. Um, if I can call up uh, the representative from DNS Automotive. Hello, Joe Capoli, DNS Automotive. Thank you. Please tell us about the contract. The contract is to deliver application specific parts in one hour or less to your all of your automotive needs. We've been doing it for 30 years, we're really good at it. Uh, one of the aspects of the contract that I think we're very good at is that we deliver uh, high quality auto parts. There's a lot of offshore product that's coming in now. What's frustrating for me and my competitor over here is that if I gave you a set of brake pads for your car, I can give you a set of brake pads for $11 or I can give you a set of brake pads for $30. The $30 brake pad is a lot higher quality. The problem is, is the bidding process doesn't necessarily allow for that. The nice thing about Essex County is that you guys are very specific in your brand, and I commend you to continue to be very brand specific because when you have a cop car going down the street or down a road at 90 miles an hour and he's got to stop on the brakes, it does make a difference whether you have that $11 brake pad on there or the $35 brake pad, and I commend you guys for doing that. Questions. I invite everybody to come visit our stores to see what we do because it's quite a unique operation for a small business like they were speaking about before. Nothing? I'd love to talk about auto parts. <laughs> 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 where, where are you located? Wait, wait around until after the meeting. I'm around. Yeah. I'm a former counselor in Clifford. I'm so glad I'm not on that side of this. <laughs> I can tell by the way you took the microphone. Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, me neither. I, I always take the mic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not as polished, but <laughs> trying to be. My name is Jim Calabro. I'm a representative for Samuels Bywise Auto Parts. Um, we are we are very unique in the in the automotive parts business. We have various contracts with counties and municipalities. We are one of 95 warehouses in the country that offer AC Delco Motorcraft OE parts for the police vehicles and which makes that very important uh, when Essex County when they're looking to buy uh, something that is federally mandated by the government and safety standards that are regulated that they're buying a part that requires that by the OE manufacturers we are the manufacturer we are the distributor for Motorcraft Ford and AC Delco and as Joe was saying that it's very crucial on what parts you would put on that vehicle, not only for safety regulations, but also for quality and longevity. So uh, we pride ourselves in brand uh, brand product. We, we have five warehouses. We are on, uh, our flagship is in Union Springfield Avenue in the Vauxhall area. And we do um, have over 60 drivers which deliver within an hour time to your facility, West Bradford Street. So we appreciate, we've been a vendor for uh, Essex County for many years. We appreciate uh, the, uh, the, the continuity between the, the county and, and us as a company, as a vendor. And we just wanna thank everyone here tonight for 
your support, and we will continue to support you in your efforts to do uh, quality work as you're in your facilities. Thank you. Mr. McInerney? No question. Mr. Long? No question. Mr. Chilla? Uh, resolution 8, uh, Department of Public Works, Division of Engineering. Uh, this is an amendment to the existing shared services agreement between Hudson County and Essex County. As you know, we do have uh, bridges that border the two counties, uh, Clay Street Bridge, the Jackson Street Bridge. And uh, the agreement we have in place is that uh, a county, each county, will serve as a lead agency, uh, and during their term as lead agency, they will secure the, the bids for the improvements, and then the second vendor or the other county will then divvy up and pay the county uh, their share of the improvements. Uh, what this uh, amendment speaks to is kind of a change in the way uh, the payments are made. Uh, the new change will be that rather than a Hudson County making a payment to Essex for their share, their 50% share of the cost, uh, and then the county then paying 100% over to the vendor, we will have the individual invoices uh, divvied up 50% for each uh, county. Each county will be responsible to paying the vendor their full share, uh, which would alleviate a lot of uh, uh, unnecessary bookkeeping for the lead agency. But the, the general principle of the shared service agreement stays in force. This only addresses how payments are made uh, to the vendors who are doing the repairs. Thank you. Uh, resolution 9, uh, Division of Public Works contract award to air systems maintenance, the lowest responsive, responsible bidder uh, to provide for MEP and HVAC services at county facilities. Um, we do have the vendor with us this evening, uh, Tom Crozer and uh, Pete Zimmerman. Yes, my name is uh, Peter Zimmerman. I'm uh, president of Air Systems Maintenance. Um, <clears throat> we've done a number of contracts in the county for uh, heating and air conditioning contracting, and we also have done the maintenance in the county. In fact, we did some work right in this building here, in this room. Um, we've been in business 50 years, and uh, uh, I've uh, enjoyed a relationship with the county, and I think we've done a, a, a good job. Thank you. Mr. McInerney? No questions. Ms. Salam? No questions. Free Holders? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chalala? Uh, I believe that's uh, six through nine. Free Holders, do you have a mover and a second to take resolution six through nine? I'll move it. Moved by Freeholder Vice President second. Gill. Second. Second by Freeholder Bobadilla. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Um, Freeholder Torrell, absent. Freeholder Siebel? Yes. Freeholder Richardson? Yes. Freeholder Luciano, absent. Freeholder Jones? Yes. Freeholder Johnson? Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill? Yes. Freeholder Bobadilla? Yes. Freeholder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Please move to resolution number 15 and read. Resolution 15, Department of Citizen Services, Division of Youth Services, Amendment to Agreement between the County of Passaic and the County of Essex for housing uh, Passaic County juveniles, extending the term of the agreement through December the 31st, 2034. Okay. Mr. Chalala? Uh, yes, uh, this agreement, as the uh, county knows, uh, uh, the County of Essex and uh, Passaic County had entered into the Share Services Agreement. Uh, back in 2009. Uh, it's been a very successful shared services arrangement where the County of Essex 
houses the Passaic County male and female detainees at our youth detention center. Uh, on an average daily population, the county of Passaic uh, has uh, roughly 25 to 30 uh, individuals that are housed with us. Uh, Passaic County, in addition to uh, paying the, uh, the cost of housing, uh, pays for their medical, their transportation, and their educational costs. It has been a very fruitful relationship. Uh, we are looking to extend the terms of this contract uh, through December 31st of 2034, and we are capping the per diem uh, increase to roughly 2%. We do have director use with us this evening. Uh, I know at leadership there was a question as to is this, uh, is the county operating at a loss by doing this? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, as you know, we're running a facility 24 7. We do have fixed costs, uh, staffing, electricity, utilities. Uh, this helps to offset those costs. The director use. Madam President, board. Um, Dennis Sheehan Hughes, Director, Essex County Juvenile Detention Center. Um, I can merely echo what uh, Ralph has already said. This agreement was originally in 2009, proposed for 10 years. Um, and let me just highlight that by saying at that time, every county in the state of New Jersey, with maybe the exception of two, had their own juvenile facility to handle their issues. To date, there are only six. And Essex County happens to be one of those facilities. Um, it's been a good partnership with uh, Passaic County. It's helped us in all setting our costs um, to operate. It's been excellent. Uh, one of the great things for Essex County that is guaranteed that 200 plus employees maintain their jobs. Um, and we did not have to close down. They, they pay for the education, they pay for their share of uh, medical, they pay for their share of food, um, and, and it's been a good relationship. I also like to highlight that the causes of, uh, that we sustain are causes we would ever sustain anyway, uh, meaning that our set cost for medical <coughs> is set with our contract, our set cost for education is set in our contract, and it's the same way with our food distribution. Those courses are already set, so our relationship with Passaic County has really helped us to all set those costs um, and help us have some type of revenue. Thank you. Mr. McInerney? No questions. Ms. Salam? No questions. Three holders? <coughs> okay. Thank you. Please move to resolution 23 and 24 and read. Resolution 23, Department of Administration and Finance, Offices of Purchasing Authorization to use the competitive comp contracting process in order to solicit proposals from qualified vendors for the provision of consulting services to assist the Essex County <coughs> Department of Citizen <coughs> Services Division of Family Assistance and Benefits in Developing the Process Improvement Strategies for Continual Agency Enhancement. Uh, yes, Madam President. Uh, as you know, to in order to utilize the competitive contracting process to solicit proposals, uh, the county must seek the uh, per permission or the approval by the governing body. Uh, we are coming to the governing body seeking permission to go out and competitively contract uh, or, or, or request bidders to submit proposals uh, under the Division of Family Services and Benefits in developing a process of improvement strategies and continually and continual agency enhancements. Uh, once that uh, uh, competitive contracting is advertised, uh, evaluations will be made. Uh, that particular award or recommendation by the using agency will then come back to this board for an actual approval. Thank you. Mr. McInerney? Did, did we ever have a consultant perform these services before for this department? Uh, through you, Madam President, yes, we have. Um, as you know, uh, a few years back when we went through 
Uh, I believe there were two phases of uh, modernization of welfare uh, where we uh, had an outside consultant. We had some of it funded by the state one year, and, and uh, I think a percentage was shared in the second year. Uh, that brought us into the, uh, the new technology from, to, from case banking uh, to computerization to modernization of the, uh, of the office. And this is going to continue that process of looking at best case practices and strategies for continuous uh, quality improvements. How much was this contract last year? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not certain. I'm going to have to get back to you. Okay. And the other thing is, um, being that it's a, it involves um, you know, citizen services, this is Department of Welfare? That is correct. Uh, as you would know, this, would, yeah. Would this be uh, subject to um, partial reimbursement through the formula? Correct. Yeah, uh, so about 86 percent or so? Or? Yes. Um, there is a... There's a quasi uh, f uh, floating formula to be reimbursed anywhere from 40 to 60 percent, so in that range. So in that range, we'll uh, But I would like to highlight that, uh, as you know, we did have a press conference announcing the name change uh, of the Division of Welfare, and that was all out of the outgrowth of, one, of phase two to kind of modernize not only the technology and the way we deliver services, but also and what people think in terms of the name and services that the county provides, and that is why uh, it is now called the Division of Family Assistance and Benefits, uh, our office. I'll make a note of that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Three elders. Ms. Salam. No question. Mr. Chalala. Uh, resolution 24. Again, the administration is seeking the uh, authorization to utilize the competitive contracting process in order to solicit proposals from qualified vendors for the provision of grant procurement services. Um, uh, we are looking to solicit proposals for various grant writing, exploring grant writing initiatives, and this competitive contracting process will allow us to do so. Very good. Uh, Mr. McInerney? No questions. Ms. Salam? No questions. Free holders? There's, uh, we need clarity whether or not this was read into the record, but if not, it can be read into the record at a later time. Do I have a mover and a second to take resolutions 23 through 24? I'll move it. And 15. Move it. Moved by Freeholder Bobadilla. Second. second by Freeholder Jones. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Free Elder Toro? Yes. Free Elder Siebel? Yes. Free Elder Richardson? Yes. Free Elder Luciano, absent. Free Elder Jones? Yes. Free Elder Johnson? Yes. Free Elder Vice President Gill? Yes. Free Elder Bobadilla? Yes. Free Elder President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Uh, number 25 is being withdrawn by the Free Elder Board. Please read resolutions 26 through 38. Uh, resolution uh, 26, resolution joining with the Montclair Mayor and Township Council and recommending rejection of the application of Fulbright Academy to establish a charter school in the Township of Montclair, sponsored by Freeholders Guild and Timberlake. Uh, I believe this is now by acclamation. Please continue. Resolution urging the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to issue the strongest possible rule to address the predatory lending sponsored by uh, Freeholder uh, President Timberlake. Uh, resolution uh, 28, um, in memoriam for uh, uh, Lydia Fullerton, Sponsored by Freeholder Jones, 29 in memoriam. Juanita Tootsie Thomas, sponsored by Freeholders uh, Timberlake, Jones, and Richardson. Resolution 30, accommodation honoring Hallie a Gamble on her 75th birthday and celebrating 45 years of dedicated educational service, sponsored by Freeholder Timberlake. Resolution 31, accommodation honoring Yvonne Lowen on her 80th birthday, sponsored by Freeholder Timberlake. 
32. Uh, accommodation honoring a Newark flight football as they present a free youth football clinic, August 13, 2016, sponsored by Freeholder Timberlake. Uh, 34, accommodation honoring Kyle Moore Brown, honoree of Newark flight football, free youth football clinic, August 13, 2016, sponsored by Freeholder Timberlake. Uh, 35, combination honoring Rufus Johnson on his 60th birthday, sponsored by Acclamation. Resolution 36, combination, commendation honoring Xavier Reyes, uh, Reyes uh, Essex County recipient of the 2016 Scholarship Program Award from the NJAC Foundation and PSENG Green, uh, sponsored by Acclamation. The next two combinations are for the same honor, honoring Virginia, Virginia uh, Cardona, and that's Resolution 37, and Resolution 38 is honoring Carmen Franco. Thank you. Three others. We have a mover in a second to take resolutions 26, through 38. Move it. Moved by Freeholder Richardson. I'll second. Second by Freeholder Jones. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Uh, Freeholder Bobadilla. Yes. Freeholder Vice President Gill. Yes. Freeholder Johnson. Madam President, may I be added to 33 and 34? And yes. Okay. Freeholder Jones. Yes. Freeholder Luciano absent. Freeholder Richardson. Yes. Freelda Seabold? Yes. Freelda Toro? Yes. Freelda President Timberlake? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Okay, we move to report of board committees. Are there any report of board committees? Are there any legislative reports? Written communication? Unfinished business? New business to discuss? Now we're going to open a public comment session. If there's any member of the public wishing to comment on any issue at all, please come forward. State your name and affiliation for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Ma Ray Cowboy, 48th District, uh, District Leader, Newark, Weekway Park, and, and Dayton Street. I uh, wanted to mention the beauty of the park that has been put there by the track and uh, field and uh, track around the walking track. I see a lot of people coming to the park behind that is creating a lot of uh, enthusiasm on what's going to be what's going to happen there and i was looking at i said all of the activities around that park i noticed over in the children's uh, playground there's only one water fountain and that water fountain is like flooded all the time with water in the, in the pan where they drink from. And I even see some of the kids drinking the water out of the pan. And it's, it's, it's really uh, appalled to me uh, seeing uh, all the facilities around that park mm -hmm. and the way things, the basketball and everything, and there is no water for anybody to drink around there, around that park. And I, I've heard of, of water fountains being removed that wasn't being used, but I was wondering why is it that they have a big park like that with all the activities and you can't even get a drink of water, even, even in the, uh, the playground area of the, uh, inside the facilities of, of uh, 92 that there's no drinking water fountains. They, the water that they're drinking is from the faucet. And it's a shame that, uh, that like this time and day, and they're talking about all the water uh, problems that we're having, and you don't have but one water fountain for those kids to drink water in that playground. Also in the playground area where the uh, basketball players are playing. They have uh, a lot of uh, electric uh, facilities there for 
charging up the phones, but I don't see none of them working. I asked about that before. I was wondering if there's a way that the electric can be checked out to where they can plug in a, a phone and a, a, that, a, that type of thing there while they're playing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cowboy. Are there any other members of the public wishing to comment at this time? Let the record reflect there's no other member of the public wishing to speak at this time. We're going to close public comment sessions. All right. Freeholders, we're opening up freeholder comment session. Are there any freeholders that would like to have a comment? Realtoral? Madam President, I just wanted to thank you for a very well attended um, foreclosure prevention workshop that you held in East Orange. Uh, the members of the audience seem very appreciative that this board is, you know, taking steps in providing information on what op other options that may be available to them. Uh, and we also call that the Sun Initiative, and I believe that the next one uh, will probably be scheduled in Irvington. Mm -hmm. So, correct. you know, the board will be informed of that when we have a scheduled date and time. And also, I want to thank the administration, Ralph, um, for uh, scheduling a meeting with Engineer Sanjeev and Councilwoman Renee Baskerville um, by request of Freeholder Vice President Gill and myself. Um, you know, we discussed uh, the issues that are happening in that intersection with all the accidents in High Street, Orange Road, and Irving Street. And uh, we discuss, you know, there will be striping going on in the next two weeks. And I believe at her local level, she uh, hopefully will garner the support of the council members um, for a four-way stop uh, to prevent accidents. And if she's successful, that will eventually be brought upon this board for the local support. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that, you know, hopefully that comes by and um, that issue will hopefully be less accidents, if any, at all. Thank you. Thank you, Freel Tutorial. Thank you also for your support and everything um, that you have also done uh, centering around foreclosures. You know, we passed legislation requiring the banks to come before us to talk about what it is that they're doing. We love to brag here in Essex County how we're number one in things, but I don't like the fact that we're number one in foreclosures. So, you know, this is something that the entire board, I just encourage everybody just to disseminate the information as much as possible and see what you can do in your community because it, it truly is a serious issue. Um, free elders, any other comments? Motion to adjourn? Move it.